Alrighty, and we're on. So I'm here uh, with Jeremy Skinner. Hey there. Hey, yep. And so, um, you know, for the uninitiated, well, Jeremy's, um, you know, a, a professional grappler. Yeah. Um, and uh, I guess where, I'd, where, I'd, where I thought we'd start the podcast today is, um, so we actually met um, back in October 2016, and yep. it was a grappling industries comp. Um, I got submitted by Hillhook. Um, <laughs> my mate Dexter also got submitted by Hillhook, and, and we were just actually giggling about this before because, you know, when I was um, I was trying to find you know my old video uh, of my match with Jeremy as well, so I could have a look back and and look at you know how far the progression in, in in my game, and I'm sure, and that's what I was saying to Jeremy is that I'm sure when he looks back on those videos, it's like you, you're you're almost embarrassed by the level that you have. Oh, I I try not to look back on those videos. <laughs> like it's it's makes me uncomfortable when I when I look at like how I used to do jujitsu and like even like. As we were saying before, when we were talking about this, like even like a year ago, like if I look back at like things I was doing then, I'm like, oh, that's like terrible. Yeah. <laughs> like I, like even like remembering my thought process behind certain things that like I did like a year ago, I'm like, why did I think that was a good idea? Like, like the rationale behind that doesn't make sense at all. Yeah. Yep. Um, there's other things where I look back and I go, that was terrible, but I understand why it was terrible. But there's just other things where I'm like, oh, that was like cringeworthy yeah exactly yeah. like it's I, I think that part of it as well is like exactly that is like you can do things that are like bad because like when you start out in jujitsu it's like you don't know anything so you can't just do things perfectly yeah but i guess like if you remember like the reasoning you have why <laughs> behind like the way you did something it's like that can also be cringeworthy yeah. itself i think it's the um the old you know the steps to conscious competence yeah. right so whenever you start any endeavor um you, you begin at uh, unconscious incompetence because you don't know what you don't know yeah. Right. And then the next step is then you realize, holy shit, there's a whole gambit of things that I don't understand about this this game. So you move to this the next stage, which is conscious incompetence, yeah. where you're consciously incompetent of all the things that you you, you realize how how big you know um, it is. Yeah. And then and then I think you know um, where I'd say you know uh, we were probably at you know that five years ago was probably we're at that stage where it was. Um, where it was unconscious competence, where it's like you know you can do certain things, but you don't really know why it's working. Yeah. And so you have success with it, right? And and I actually, um, I, one of my recent posts on Instagram was about my, my first ever MMA fight, right? Um, so I did a pancreation comp. And um, so that's no no hits to the head, but, you know, with the, the grappling strikes to the body. And I actually, um, I, I, my first ever match, I actually won. And, I, and, and what I was saying was that that was actually like a pyrrhic victory for me because I didn't really, uh, I don't think I, I knew enough um, to have earned that victory. And then because you've found success once before, you go, you immediately think the next time you lose, well, oh, maybe that was just luck, you know, because I, I, I can obviously win um, mm. and I've won before, but then why am I now losing? And you, and you fail to realise that, hey, you've actually got technical comp- incompetencies or flaws, yep. that, that that's why you're losing. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and on that as well, like uh, across a longer period of time, I guess you can extrapolate that to this idea of like, you know, conscious incompetence, conscious competence, um, unconscious incompetence, like, like so on, like... I'd say you'd, um, it also goes sort of back and forth across that where you reach a level of what you think is conscious competence, yep. but then you, you realize that it's, uh, it's a degree of unconscious incompetence, but also, oh, sorry, uh, unconscious competence, but then also to a degree of like unconscious incompetence as you realize there's more and more layers to like what yep. you're doing. Like it's the um, le- the levers that you pull, there's it, more levers. You, you work out there's more levers that you can pull. Exactly. Or you realize you're pulling the wrong one for the wrong or you're pulling the right one for the wrong reasons and mm. like you, you associate it with things that you already understand and so you go oh this is working because of that reason or you can even realize like you can have the right idea but you're implementing it the wrong way like the, the and then you know like just over time you you work out a simpler way to do things like like the, i just find like this uh like like a good example of that is fundamentals in jiu-jitsu like mm. like they're, they're not static i'd say that they're actively changing and so i i feel like like when we look at like say something high, like uh uh, quite an involved game like leg lock let's say mm. um like having that sort of process to it we're reevaluating like uh, our fundamentals behind the way that they work and like yep. you're reassessing like your understanding of like how things work in jiu-jitsu on like a fundamental level yep. so i certainly agree with like that idea of like ex- like moving from unconscious incompetence to i guess like conscious competence yeah conscious competence yep. like like that, that layer there but then i feel like it also like over time like it goes back and back, forth as yeah. like you're trying to stay like on the cutting edge of things well that's yeah i think that's also so in in my work right like i, I always pitch that to people that a lot of the times people think that they get to conscious competence but then they're they're at that complacency stage which yep. is actually you know um unconscious competence because you're not really thinking about what you're doing yeah you're just going okay i'm getting results so i'm going to keep doing it the same way without really challenging your ideas 
Absolutely. I, I completely agree with that. Like I'm, I really try and reevaluate like um, just my, my own core ideas on terms of like how jujitsu works, like, like trying to just like reflect on that and also try and see if like there's exceptions, like try and find the exceptions to like my understanding. Like if I, if I think like certain techniques work a certain way and like certain, t- like, you know, certain techniques don't work because of a particular reason, I try and find exceptions to that understanding. And it's like, like so that way you can sort of understand more like the shades of gray, um, and like more clearly define like why certain things work or don't work in jujitsu. Yeah. Like um like one uh, yeah one more recently is like um belly down heel hooks. Um j- like there's something like Craig was talking to me about um with heel hooks recently is just like this idea of like belly down heel hooks. Now that was like an old idea that um we like like that was a good idea in theory I'd say like a while ago. Mm. But then like we sort of did away with that. But then it's sort of come back again, but for different reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, and like so, so it's interesting to see like in some ways things like that coming full circle. It's the same with like reaping heel hooks, like you saw with uh twenty fifteen like guys like Eddie Cummings coming along for example with leg yep. locks and they're not playing a lot of reaping heel hooks. They're playing more like feet locked to the outside, like an outside yep. ashy. Yep. But then you see we come full circle again back to like reaping heel hooks and uh, using them for a lot of setups mm. and like different variations of that. And we're, and we're back to doing that not for the same reasons that we were before, but for different reasons. Yep. Yeah, it's, so, the, it's the evolution of it, right? Exactly. And that's why you need it. I think constantly reevaluate it because, because the sport is still growing and still evolving. We need to like keep that in mind that like you know that means that our fundamentals are going to be changing and evolving too. Mm. And I think even the way that we um, the way that um, it's taught nowadays, right? Like I think there's a there's a real sort of um, shift. Like there's obviously you know a lot of the fundamentals are still taught as uh, very technique based. Um, that you know okay here's a here's a, a side control escape or a mount escape or something like that. But then I think um, more and more uh, people are starting to now um, trying to think back to what are the actual concepts here. You know, and I think that's a very, you know, uh, you know, I guess it's a kind of a Danaher influence, right? Where, you know, when you think about, um, you know, a, a, a pin, top pin or something, and you yep. think about, you know, what what's inqu- required for a top pin to be effective, you know, and you talk about wedges and, and these sorts of things. Like, I think, um, and, I, and I know they're, they're probably not new ideas, right? But um, because of the success that, you know, that team has had, um, that sort of progressed through um, to a lot of other teams in the way that they approach their teaching focus, right? Yep. Yeah. So I guess, you know, there's a whole, there's a whole bunch of things that I want to talk about in terms of jujitsu, but I actually, let's, um, let's actually pull it all back and, okay. and we'll go back to, um, you know, what would be, uh, I guess you as a, you as a kid and, and what would be your earliest memory, right? Earliest memory in my entire life. Um, when I was about three years old, I remember, um, because it's, it's funny actually, cause, cause we're in Sydney right now. I, when I was growing up, um, when I was about three years old, uh, my parents uh, and myself and my brother like lived in Little Bay, which is like 10 minutes away from where we are now. So yep. it's interesting, like since then, like I've moved around Australia a lot, like lived in, like even lived overseas briefly and now back back around almost to like where I grew up essentially. Like, yep. um, but so, so my earliest memory was probably when I was about three years old over in Little Bay, 10 minutes away from here. And I just remember like... Um, being like you know trying to like run along the side of the road trying to like run as fast as the cars were driving along the road but like yeah. obviously like I can't keep up with the cars but yeah. I just remember like trying to do that when I was like that age yep um I also remember um at that time like that exact same place that we lived at my neighbor I think it was a kid named Luke and he had a little uh toy set up and it was of basically the battle of Endor from Star Wars where it had like a little setup with like the AT walkers yep. and the, the traps from the Ewoks where yep. like the, the logs would swing, swing down past. and like hit the thing like yep. and like like another log trap where you'd pull a little stick and like these plastic logs would roll down and it's meant to topple the the little AT walker. So I, I, I remember that from, from that period. Yep. And so did you always like Star Wars or was that something? always 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 um yep. I remember having I think it was the I can't remember if it was like the first or the second remastered edition of uh, the the original Star Wars um, trilogy on on videotape. I remember my dad because uh, my dad was in the military. He had come back from fighting in East Timor mm. um, when Australia was over there, and so uh, when he came back, I think he he brought me like a, a copy of like the original Star Wars trilogy on like videotape, yep. and I watched that so many times, and it had um. I, I know it was the rem- like it was a like digital a, remaster. Yeah, the digital digital yeah. remaster because I think actually you know what I think it was the first one because I think this was in it. It had a section on like when they redid Jabba the Hutt from being like a person to yep. to being like the animated Animation. creature that he is now. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um. So so I I yeah I always love Star Wars. Yep. 
And, and funnily enough, it's May the 4th today. <laughs> oh, yeah. There you go. It's Star Wars May Day. May the 4th so be with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So, your dad was in the military. So, did he – so, he would have been in and out of home a lot, correct? Um. Y- Yes and no. So, so dad was an officer. He's a, a major in the infantry. So, so we had to move around a little bit, but probably just around that time, maybe a year, year and a half afterwards, he actually got out of the military. Okay. So, so when he was with my mum, like they they had to move around a bit. But dad was an officer, so like he didn't have to move around too much. Too much yep. But that might just be my perception of it, because like to me, like we've moved around quite a fair bit as I've like grown up. So like to me, yep. it might be like, oh, we haven't like you know they didn't move that much. But I guess. For some people, like any moving at all through their childhood is probably like yep. a, like a lot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, um, for example, like I was born in Brisbane, and then at that stage we were living in Sydney. So, so I think we'd only lived in Sydney for maybe about a year or so. Then Dad got out of the uh, got out of the infantry, um, and then we were living on the central coast after that. Okay, and so then, um, so schooling wise, did you so you would have gone to school uh, to a school at Central Coast public school? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I originally. Um, I, I went to a public school, Copacabana Public School, and then after that, I moved to a uh, a Catholic uh, primary school mm-hmm. over in uh, Kingcumber. Okay. So, so because uh, just my mom wanted me to go to a Catholic school, my my, my dad's indifferent when it comes to religion. To religion. Yeah, yeah, he's like, but uh, my, but I think dad was happy for me to go to that school just because it was a good school. Yep. Um. Yeah. So, so mainly a Catholic education growing okay. up. And so, as a as a child in school, like, wh- how would you have described yourself in primary school? Um quite weird like quite sort of awkward bit dorky yeah. actually very dorky yeah and what <laughs> yeah. Did, just from your interests or um also personality wise like i i i like i, I certainly like i had friends like i, I didn't have a yeah. like problem making friends but i was never going to be like a cool kid or anything like that like and then i think especially like moving into high school as well like like as like you know as you're growing up and your interests develop more like like getting more into video games um like like into soccer and I was okay at soccer, but like, like, uh, yeah. So like, as I grow up, like getting more into video games and more sort of nerdier topics and yep. things like that. Like, yeah. Like, um, it's funny actually, cause I remember I used to play a lot of call of duty yep. in high school and like there was, a uh, in, in my like years at school, um, you know, there, there's, I guess the quote unquote cool kids. Um, but I'd play like a lot of Call of Duty online with the cool kids, but wouldn't hang out with them at school. Yeah, like yeah. So, but you'd be there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I see. I had a, a well, actually, one of my mates who um, was part of the reason I started this podcast. He committed suicide a, a couple of years ago, but um, he and I we used to play StarCraft yep. all the time, like Excellent. nonstop. Like it was just we were so into it. And um, you know, back then, so when we were when I was growing up, it wasn't we didn't have we weren't playing on BattleNet, so it wasn't online yet. Um, mm-hmm. So in, in the original StarCraft one. Um, basically, you know, we had to do it via modem, you know, like, yep. and then we'd get the shits <laughs> if anyone picked up the phone, um, disrupted our game. And we used to like, like literally during the school holidays, we would play until like, you know, 2am in the morning, yep. right? Then go to sleep. And then I'd call him the next day at like, you know, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning, wake him up and then say, Hey, we're on, let's go. <laughs> we'd play the whole day. You know, every time we had to go and have lunch or, or lunch or dinner, we just pause, you yep. know, and then go and eat something, come back and play. And we were just obsessed. Yeah. Right? No, I totally get that. I, I think... What I remember from uh, from school is like particularly Call of Duty three on PlayStation two. I played through the story on that like just over and over and over and over. I think I've always been drawn more towards like story based video games. Yep. Like I certainly enjoy online games, but uh, even like now, for example, like I I don't play any games online anymore. Yep. Um, I used to play a bit of Counter Strike. Yep. Um, but I I find that uh a lot of online gaming taps into the same reason as to why I got obsessed with jujitsu. Like it's just that competitive nature, that drive to get better and better and upskill. Yep. Um, so now also it's just a matter of like not distracting myself too much from jujitsu. I don't play games online anymore. Yeah. So it, like it uses just, too much resources. <laughs> exactly. Like it, I get too focused on trying to get good at that. And yep. then I, I neglect jujitsu, but also I, I also just really enjoy story based games. Yep. Okay, and so then when you were growing up, like, so were you were you academic as a kid? Were you like, what were your school results oh, like? What? My school results were like, like I'd say, like below average. Like, like I just, I just didn't put the work in that. It, like I really should have. Like I, I couldn't like make myself sit down and study, which is which is funny because like now it's like all I want to do is study jujitsu. Yep. Like, like I'll, I'll sit down, I'll take notes on it. Like I try and take notes notes every day. I'm studying mm-hmm. matches like this. Matches I'll watch over and over and over again. Um, and now, like, it's actually sort of uh, sparked my interest more into going back to, like, and, and, and going to university um, bec- just because I think, like, I'm, I'm in a 
a more mature place now where like mm. I can actually like make myself like put the work in. Yeah. Just when I was going through high school, I just could not like for whatever it is, I just lacked the maturity to yep. actually put the work in that I needed to to get like like to get the grades I got. Yeah. Because like there were kids that like got way better grades than me and like. Like, I think with school, like, everyone always talks about, like, you know, oh, this person's, like, you know, gifted or, like, yep. you know, they're quite smart. Really, I think schooling is, like, who puts the work in. Exactly. Because, like, like, in my class at school, like, the, the kids in my class that were the smart, like, all that, that had got the best grades weren't, like, like, I guess they were the smartest, but they were the smartest because they actually put the work in. Yeah. And like they, they, were, they, they probably had an interest in the, the, the kind of, like, I think it's also a little bit of success and a little bit of interest, right? They're good at yeah. it and therefore they apply themselves at it, right? So. Yeah. It could, like... And then there's also, I guess, like the the early, like I guess, yeah, like I guess you can go different ways on it. Like I haven't spent too much time looking into, I guess, like how that works, but I, I imagine like discipline's a big factor in that as well. Like yep. just the kids that have the discipline to make themselves to do the work, mm. which means that they actually get good at it, which may probably like you know drives, drives their interest more just, into actually like you yep. know maintaining like that that study ethic and, yep. and yeah. Was there was there any pressure from your parents to, you know, that they wanted you to do well or anything like that? Or were they pretty cool about, you know, no, whatever they, you wanted? They wanted me to do well. Like they were like um like I remember like um through especially like later high school, my mum got me a tutor, which I found really, really helpful. It it was funny actually. Um my tutor, what did she study? She studied um I think it was uh aeronautical engineering. Wow. Um, but she only did that so that she could be taken seriously in business because she had a business degree. Okay. So she did a double degree. <laughs> I think it was in aeronautical engineering and business. That's a, that's like a serious chip on your shoulder. Yeah. To want to be taken that seriously. Absolutely. <laughs> like like she was she, like she only did it because she goes well. I can get this degree. Yep. Like in this, and it means people will take me seriously in business. Like they'll they'll mm. you know sort of recognize my worth and like yeah. Yep. I was I was a, I was a, I was a bit the opposite. Like I I sort of in school, yeah, I played around heaps probably until about you know the final years of high school, and then and then years in eleven and twelve. Like, um, what what sort of triggered it for me is because like I'm obviously being an Asian guy, my my mum was very strict with me as a kid, um, so I got forced to do a lot of like extracurricular activity and all those sorts of things, and so then you know um, it didn't really help me at all because you know until years eleven and twelve where I sort of realised myself, hey, you know the reality is I could probably do really well. I just don't have the interest. So then I thought, okay, well, I'll knuckle down for two years to, to do, you know, the best that I can. Yep. Um, and then I did, I did pretty well in HSC. And then, you know, the only reason I, I studied what I studied at uni is because I got the marks too. So I ended up doing engineering science and law at UTS. Yep. Um, originally, I was just going to do engineering. And then it's like, oh, well, I've got the, law, the marks to be able to get into a, the law degree. So I'll just do that. Um, so that's, that's sort of how it happened for me. But, you know, you mentioned that, you, you, you know, you, you would consider going back to uni to study. What, what would it be that you'd want to study? Um, I'd like to study mathematics. That's what I actually enjoyed at school. Like, like, like I, you know, I mentioned, like I, I didn't put like the, the work in at school that I should have, yep. um, whether that was due to lack of interest or discipline, probably a combination of both, but I always found mathematics really interesting. A- any um, particular reason for that? Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I know that I've just never enjoyed like, you know, um, like, like creative writing and things like that. Like just mm. I've just I, I always struggle with that because it, it's very to me like very subjective and very uh, yep. unclear as to what like the actual the answer is. is. Like yep. I I like I I think I like the sort of like the more goal, goal orientated approach to mathematics. Yeah. Um. Like the you, like there is a correct answer. Mm. Um. I guess I gets like. I think in calculus, actually, I remember like there's some probably some situations where there wasn't necessarily one answer to a question. Like it could end up being a couple, but for the most part, there was. It was the defi- pathway. Th- th- there's definitive an- answers to questions, and there was path- pathways to them. Yep. Okay. And I think that 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 does translate to um ju- to jujitsu as well because it's a very um you know as much as it looks like when if you don't know what's going on two guys or two two people rolling around on the floor um there are very logical things in the progression to if you want to get to control um or the right position or whatever there's very um definitive steps that you need to 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 take to get there absolutely and likewise you know, there's definitive things that you need to nullify from that uh, uh, perspective as well so i think you know having that interest in maths is probably actually something that goes hand in hand with that yeah i i think like um as well as i uh, i think you see like as well like maths translate across to a lot of like other strategic decision making like with like game theory and things like that where that's less of a creative approach and it is more of a mathematical approach to things mm. so 
So when like building strategies and, and, you know, trying to like maximize your opportunities and like minimize your cost and like minimize your opponent's opportunities, maximize their costs. Like, like it also, like funnily enough, I think it translates probably back across to like what you're talking about with Starcraft. Yep. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. It's, it's, that's a real time strategy game, right? So you're good. You've got to make split second decisions that may influence, you know, you might go down a specific pathway of what you want to build but that, that might get nullified and countered by what the other person wants yeah. to do. If they've scouted your base, they know exactly what you're doing. Absolutely. And, yeah. like, I, I know that um, with competitive StarCraft, when you're looking at, like, the commentators, comment, like, talking about the matches, like, they're commenting on, like, players' actions per minute and, yeah. and like, commentating, I guess, like, on, like, resource efficiency and things like that. So, like, I think it translates across, like, strategy-wise to a lot of different things. Yeah. I want, I want to digress um, while we're talking about this, right? Because I think it's, um, it's, it's kind of important when we talk about... Um, studying film or studying tape um, that, you know, um, a lot of people, you know, might have an interest in, in trying to, you know, improve their skill set um, through study, but then they might not know how to study it effectively, yeah. right? And so I, I remember, you know, back at, even at that comp, you know, that first comp when I met you, we were, we were talking a little bit about some of the things that you'd been looking at and studying. I think back then we were, we were talking about a little bit about the straight jacket from, yep. from the back yep. and, um, and what were some of the things that you were studying. And then for me, you know, I, I started to get more interested in, in studying tape probably over the last couple of years, um, not specifically from the jiu-jitsu side of things, but, I, I, you know, I, I, I sort of do some film studies on, on MMA fights and things like that because yep. I like to look at the striking elements and how they sort of all combine. Um, but I'd like to obviously, you know, pick your brain about what are the things that, that you're looking for um, when you study tape um, because I know for me, I typically like to study things that have repetition. So when I say repetition, if I see something in a fight that happens two or three times um, and it plays out, you know, very similar pathways those two or three times to me that there's there's a there's a pathway there whereas if it's you know a lucky shot or something like that you know um it's very difficult to replicate yep. so um what is your approach and i guess when did you start studying um jiu-jitsu in more in more detail sure so i've actually um since white belt i've been st- I, I studied jiu-jitsu matches like um, early on looking like studying the Miao brothers mm. um, like when i was a white belt like trying to understand the baron bolo trying to understand playing de la Hiva, things like that um, I think the approach to, to at least early on studying tape until like you have, I guess, like a, a certain level of understanding about particular positions um, and, and sort of situations and like certain like players in jiu-jitsu is just looking for exactly that is like pattern recognition. Mm. So the idea is to look at, okay, um, I think the focus should be more on probably the the things that like uh, lead up to a particular outcome. So what I mean by that is, is like, as you mentioned, like you might like pick like one particular exchange that happens and you mm. go, Oh, look at this. Like he ended up like finishing him with like a right cross or something. Yeah. But really that right cross probably like comes from like, yeah, you know, a couple up. like some strikes that came before that. Some yep. like, you know, some feints, some movement, things like that. Mm. And the, the, the cross might actually only come up because there was an opportunity that came up from the, um from like, I guess like the, the preceding Setups, events yeah. exactly so so i think like you need to take like a similar approach with studying tape and jujitsu is like looking at what leads up to a person potentially giving a particular reaction mm. that leads to a certain attack and what you want to look for is um I- exactly that is patterns so you want to look at um multiple times a particular player uses that same setup and then from there you can look at okay these are the common reactions and the idea is you build out a bit of a game plan from there so um like if you look at like Gordon Ryan, for example, like a, like an easier one to look at is like, you know, when Gordon Ryan's controlling someone from saddle, he's controlling like the mm. second leg. He's got the control of the primary leg with his legs. He's got them locked up pretty tight. Now, typically what Gordon's trying to do from that position is he's trying to, you know, keep control of the second leg long enough that he can expose the heel yep. and like attack an inside heel hook a yep. lot of the time, at least anyway. Yep. But then different reactions you get off that is the person fighting to free the second leg so they can turn out and hide the heel. And typically a lot of the times there, what you'll find is that Gordon can start looking to come forward and follow up from that to attack the back. Mm. Um, as they start to turn away, if their hips stay low, yep. you'll see guys like Oliver Tarza in those situations. If their hips come up, he's inverting underneath instead to continue attacking the heel hook. Mm. Um, so the idea is you want to look at like, like you know, every time Gordon Ryan gets to this position, what is he doing? What is the other person trying to do? Like, you want to look at it in like a broader sense if you can. Yep. Like get a like a broader sense of like what is he 
trying to do if they do nothing? Mm. What is he trying to do if they do this? And you know, yeah. so on. You're like trying that. to understand the pathways, right? Exactly. So, but yeah. you wouldn't, you need to try and find key positions where you can see it sort of repeatable. And so a lot of the times it's easier to do that from probably more static positions. So yep. something like saddle where you got both legs controlled Control. rather than dynamic ones. Yep. And as you start to understand like like more about jiu-jitsu or even like more about particular players in jiu-jitsu, then you can start looking at more dynamic positions mm. where it's a little bit um, – those positions probably a little bit harder to follow and like recognize like – what's actually going on in those positions. But like over time, as you like get better at like actually studying footage and like, yep. like, you know, following certain players, it becomes easier to like look at the, a lot of those positions also. Yep. So then when you were, um, when you started looking at um, like, as an example, say when you were white belt and you're looking at the Meow brothers, right. Um, was that, uh, were you trying to focus on things that were also being taught in class or were you just focusing on the things that interested you? Um, it was just the things that interested me. Like I, I, I drilled like, uh, I'd take notes on things that we learned in class, for example. Like, I'd try and drill them as much as I could outside of class too with, like, different people at the gym. Um, but a lot of times I was studying tape because I wanted to just, like, see certain things in jiu-jitsu, like things yep. that I thought were cool. Yeah, okay. Yeah, like, at the time it wasn't even so much. I'm like, oh, this is, like, like what's really, really – like, you know, this is, like, what I should be learning because, again, like, as we're talking about, with like, you know, unconscious incompetence, like, I don't know what I need to know. Yeah. But I just go, oh, the Mia brothers are, like – close to my size yep. um and you know like they're really really good at jiu-jitsu so like i'm just going to try and do what they're doing yep so it was almost that like that imitation to try and you know yeah. build that understanding right yeah um and i think like gordon ryan actually um on the joe rogan podcast recently is talking about the fact that you know what they're trying to do is they're trying to look at what other high level competitors are doing and go beyond what they're doing mm. i think at an early stage though imitation is the way to go yep. like like just simply just like monkey see monkey do just copy what the high level guys are doing until you get to a certain level of competence and then you can start to yeah in, in innovate from there exactly yep. yeah and like you you have the tools that you need to be able to innovate like you understand enough about a select few positions that you had like you have a better understanding of sort of the process that goes behind developing an area of jujitsu and so then you can start doing it that way i think but i think early on that's quite hard to do yeah i I definitely like i think for most people it's like a lot of people struggle with you know having all these different names for for all the different positions um but you know over time when you start to realize well that's why that position's called this or that then you actually can string them together yeah yeah but without actually if you if you can't verbalize it and say well that's the name for that it's like you know uh trying to single out a a person in a crowd how do you do that (laughs) exactly like i think names for positions are really quite important like and i think part of it comes from like you know people will recognize that like doing a certain thing changes what's happening in a in a given position yeah but i think it's a different thing entirely to to give a name to that because then you you it almost um it clarifies certain ideas. Mm. So that's why I think like giving names to positions and to techniques um, and to variations of positions is quite important because it adds a lot more clarity to what's going on yep. and it gives you an opportunity to branch off that. Now, th- there is also the, a downside to that is when, say, for example, you fit uh, certain positions into a hierarchy and things like that. If you don't if you don't have the willingness to like sort of let go of a, like certain ideas about things and sort of reconform to like maybe a new way of doing things, then you can really sort of get stuck in old patterns and mm. not grow from there. Yep. Um, like it's similar to what we were talking about before with like this idea of like, you know, like again, like conscious competence and like how like it changes over time with an yep. evolving sport. Yeah. I, I think that's, that was like the whole um, inside versus outside Senkaku argument, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, like I, I think like, yeah, just having a willingness to, to evolve and like adapt to like things like that. Yeah. Like, and even like a willingness to try things that on the surface you go, well, that sort of breaks my understanding of certain ideas about yeah. jujitsu, but I'll give it a go anyway yeah. because I want to be able to break those ideas. Yeah. Well, I think it's a real arms race, right? Like, um, so back, you know, and, and, you know, even Gordon was saying that, you know, when they first started training as the squad, they were, they were trying to focus on, on um, breaking through with leg locks. And then, you know, as everybody's caught up, well, more high level competitors caught up on the leg locks and they've moved to other systems. And so, you know, I think to, to, to stay innovative in that sense, you, you always need to be aware that, hey, once people get to a certain level, they're going to give you those next level reactions. So as a result of that, what you do, if you still just stay stagnant and just have the same game, you won't be able to um, counter those reactions. Now you're actually getting countered because they've identified, you know, what are the counters to you, to, to the sequences that you want to operate with. Absolutely. Right? 
All right. So, um, um, so when you uh, were getting to the end of high school, what was it ha- like? Had you already was that when you had already started jujitsu? Yeah, I started jujitsu when I was sixteen. When you were sixteen, yep. yep. Okay, and then how did you how did you find jujitsu? Was it something that you know you yeah. googled, or was somebody said, "Hey, Jeremy, come to this"? Or? It, it was really um, so before that. So so when I started jujitsu, my family was living in Newcastle. Um, the year before that. Uh, we were living in Canberra, and then before that, we were living on the Central Coast. So okay. in about three years, we'd probably lived in three, three times. Yeah, yep. exactly. Like we'd lived in three different cities. Um, so when we were living on the Central Coast, probably towards the end of that, my mum was getting me like wanted me to do like a like a bit of karate and things like that, just like something to mix it up. Like yep. uh, pretty much, my mum wanted me playing like some sort of sport year round. So like in the off season for for soccer, she you could do something she, else. Exactly, yep. she wanted me just doing something else. So we'd moved to Canberra and I think um, because we were only there for not even a year, didn't really have a chance to get too settled in. Like like I um, was playing soccer while I was there just through school. Mm-hmm. Um, but around that wasn't really getting into too much else. So like, so I, I didn't have a chance to do any martial arts or anything like that while we were there. Um, but then when we moved away to, uh, to Newcastle, mum got me back into soccer uh, back into soccer um, and then back into karate too. But one day when I was at just at, at karate, like I just saw like off to the side, like just like a jiu-jitsu class going on. I thought that looks cool. I'm going to do that. And that's literally the whole story. Yeah, like wow. it, it's really just, I thought that looks like a lot of fun. I'm just going to give that a go. And so for a little while I was doing uh, karate and jiu-jitsu at the same time, but then I just dropped karate. It was just doing jiu-jitsu, drop soccer, just yep. doing jiu-jitsu. jiu-jitsu. Yep. Yeah. And then, so a couple of things I want to talk about there, right? So when you had moved around three different places in 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 basically you know as many years, um, what was it like for you? Like, because obviously you know at that age you would have been what fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, yeah. that sort of age, right? Um, in terms of making friends, like was that difficult? Where it's like, hey, or were you you sort of used to moving around? Or I was I was used to moving around. Like I I did okay. Yeah. Like yeah. Like I it um I th- I think it was actually good for me in some regards because now like. Like, as an adult, like, I feel pretty comfortable moving from place to place, like, moving from, you know, Newcastle down to Melbourne, like, mm. to, to switch what I was doing and, like, you know, go full-time on jiu-jitsu training uh, under Lachlan Giles. Um, and then, you know, uh, just happening, like, to between the two lockdowns, like, because Melbourne went into two lockdowns for people that... I guess yeah. don't know. Um, so so I came up to Sydney. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So so after the first lockdown, I'd come up to Sydney just temporarily, and then Melbourne went into a second lockdown. So like because I just I feel pretty comfortable being nomadic. I guess like yep. it was just easy for me to stay here and yep. you know keep going. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like um, I think when I was eighteen, I I went and lived in London for six months by myself. So like yep, like I found that pretty comfortable. Like. like yeah, just moving around, I found easy, and I think just for like because growing up, moving around a bit. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So then, um, when you're in London, what we, did you go there to to do jujitsu? No, or? I just did it for something because I, I finished high school. Um, I didn't like because I was uh, as as we're talking about like with with school, like I just clearly did not have either the motivation or the discipline for study yep. like yet. Um, so like I finished school and I was like, well, I'm not really ready to go to university. Like, yeah. so I just thought, oh, well I'll go and, uh, like just go to like, go to the UK for a little while, like, and sort of just, you know, work there and just like, like live there for a little bit by myself and just like sort of see, w- see where it takes me. Like, and, and just like, just for a different experience, just to break up what I'm doing. So I just did that for six months. Um, and I, cause I, I had a two year visa for there, but I only went for six months only because, Really, I just felt like uh, it wasn't like a pretty a particularly productive experience. Like it was, it was a good chance to like get away, like be on my own, and like like sort of do my own thing. But I think in the uh, particularly in London, like the the minimum wage there isn't very high, and like it was just difficult to create like positive environments to like you know build anything to take away from that. So it was more like an extended holiday, really. So yep. Like, yeah. yeah. Um. So this was so like it was a it was a really good growing experience for me, like personally, to be able to like m- like live out of home for a little bit, like yep. at like Kinda a relatively young age. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And like like working for myself, paying my own rent and things like that, as well as just like just different life experiences that came up like while I was there. Like like I remember getting robbed once. <laughs> like like <laughs> you got to tell me about that. Oh, uh, it's not. It's not. not a, tell me about that. It, it's not even like a particularly glamorous like experience. It was just like I just like I was just like had a night out and I just realized I had like my wallet stolen. Like, 
like oh okay so you just you yeah, were, did, yeah. You, you were partying and then it yeah like, it was just like just got stolen from me and then like they somehow managed to take four thousand dollars out of my bank account shit yeah like like because i had money saved up for like when i was uh going over there yeah but then like i remember actually i remember exactly the day where i decided that i i need to move back home is just uh because i lived in a share house and so in the share house i lived in it was out in a, a suburb called limehouse in like like probably like just like sort of east of like city of london yeah um uh, just for people that don't know as well as like their city of london and then there's london so yeah like that yeah so city of london's like like probably like a small city right in the middle of like greater London. So I lived like just east of that in Limehouse. And uh, I, I, so I lived in a share house at the time and I lived on the top floor and there was uh, uh, two other people on my floor with me, like with their own rooms, second floor of the house. There was uh, some, just some like Latvian guys that lived there. <laughs> and then on the bottom floor, there was like these three Spanish guys that lived in one room. And so they just used to grow like weed in the backyard. Like, and I, I, like, <laughs> like I, yeah, exactly. Like, it's not my thing, but like, I, like, I don't care. Like, like they can do whatever they want. But, um, like the day I decided to move out was because the neighbors, uh, jumped the fence and stole all of, uh, the Spanish guys weed out of the backyard. Oh, and no. so, so the Spanish guys were going to go over and stab the neighbors. Yep. And I was just like, yeah, I think I'm done. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't need to get involved in like this tiny little feud. Like yep. I just, like, yep. I don't want to like risk getting stabbed, stabbed. or anything like that. Yep. Like I'm just... I'm just going to go home. <laughs> yeah. So then but was, everything was pretty amicable with these guys, obviously living in the same oh, house. Yeah, no, I had no problems with yeah. them. It was more the fact that like if the neighbours were going to like, you know, if they were going to get stabbed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If they're going to go stab the neighbours and the neighbours are going to come back and attack, attack us. Attack everyone, yeah. I was like, uh, I'm out. I should just go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I'm just going to go home. I've had enough. So so then, you know, did you just what call, 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 call the oldies and then book your ticket and then just go, I'm coming home. Well, I, I think, I can't remember exactly what it was, but I, I think I had, like, a flexible, like... Ah, uh, yeah, like, one of those like tickets return tickets. Could, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. like a flexible return ticket. So, yep. so like, I could just sort of, like, organise that. And yep. so I just, like, yeah, I just called mum and dad. I'm like, yeah, I think I'm just going to come home now. <laughs> like, <laughs> I've had enough. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So not a particularly gr- a glamorous end to a not a particularly glamorous trip, but... Yep. Uh, it was a good life experience. Yeah. Okay. And then was there any, um, so work-wise, what sort of jobs were you doing when you were over there? I was just bartending. Like, okay. uh, I, I was doing like a lot of like contract bartending. So I was working at like, like um, small fashion shows. Like, uh, um, I remember there was like a, yeah, like a fashion show for a magazine. I was working a little bit in-house at like a place called Marks and Spencer. Yep. Like I was just doing like lots of like little odd, odd things. Jobs. Like I was doing like bartending at like parties and stuff. Yep. Just like lots of little things. Like uh, one time, uh, I worked one night because uh, they needed someone to fill in for uh, at the O2 Arena um, for I think it was like what was it Robbie Williams Swing Both Ways concert like, yep. like huge so, yeah exactly yep. like so so worked there just one night like just like lots of little things here yep. and there and so for you at that point in time did you have any idea what you wanted to do from a career perspective from no a I- life perspective no idea at all no like, idea yep. no idea I th- I think at the time um I actually you know while I was over there because uh growing up I wanted to join the military like uh like like the old man um while I was over in the UK I actually considered just because it would help improve my like my circumstances I was actually going to join um I looked into joining uh the like the the british military because i remember as a teenager i'd actually read a book of an australian guy that just joined the military while he was over there and so i went into the office i think i was going to try and join the royal marines um like while I, like just while i was there because like it was just like it would be something cool to do like it means i could travel more potentially like as a part of like work it means i'd be in a better financial situation um as well as like it was just something i'd be generally interested in like you know be a, you know like a, an environment where you can get physically fit yep um, just like a variety of reasons, like for the same reasons that when I was in Australia, I was considering joining the military. But I think they le- they they changed the law. I think twelve months ago, where um, you had to be a permanent, or I think you had to be a permanent resident in the UK to join the military. Okay. Because uh, like I don't, I don't yeah. know why they changed it, but yeah. That, so so that was something I looked into while yeah. I was there. Um, and so when I came back home, like joining the military was something that I was thinking about doing, like joining the infantry. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And so then, um, did you do any jiu-jitsu training when you were over there? I couldn't afford to. Okay. I, I lived right next to um, 10th Planet London. Yep. Um, it was literally like around the corner from where I live, but I was just like... Prohibitively like, expensive ex- or compared to what you're making. 
Exactly. Compared to yeah. what I was making, like, like uh, I think, like, 10th Planet London, like, I've trained there since then, like, when mm. I've been on, like, subsequent, subsequent trips to the UK for jiu-jitsu. Yep. Um, I've had a chance to train there. Um, but it just, I, I was living on, like, 12 pounds an hour. Yeah. Oh, sorry, not 12 pounds an hour. It was 7 pounds an hour, which I think at the time equated to, like, 12 Australian dollars, dollars an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Okay. And so then what was, so food-wise, what was that like? Like, were oh, you just that scripting was, or? I, I think my main meal at the time was, it was um, pasta. Yep. Like, like just ran, like random pasta, not with anything special in it other than melted, like melting butter on top of it for some flavor. Yep. I, I think that's what I was mainly eating. <laughs> Sometimes I get some like, uh, like the, the sachets of like the, the mixed vegetables and I could like mix them in. So that yep. way I actually had like some additional, like some actual nutrients <laughs> in what I was eating. Um, but that was the main thing I recall eating at the time. Yeah. Okay. And that, that's what something I just remembered about you is that you're, you're a vegetarian as well, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. I, I am now. At the time I was an involuntary vegetarian. Okay. <laughs> when I was in the UK. <laughs> okay. So the vegetarian thing was more of a recent thing, is it? Um. Yeah. That, that was something that uh, came up, I think. Probably maybe two or three years ago. Maybe, okay. maybe, maybe two years ago, I'd say. Yep. Yeah. And was there anything in particular that made you decide to go down that pathway? Um, it, it, uh, ethical decision. Um, I, there was a video I saw on Facebook one time of, um, I think pigs for like factory pigs, farming. Like, yeah, exactly. Like factory farming, like pigs getting slaughtered and like how aware they were of the, the circumstance they're in. Um, I recently did a podcast with, uh, one of my teammates, JT, and we were just talking about like, you know, um, uh, being an athlete on a vegetarian diet. So for me, like one of the things, um, that I've got to consider with jiu-jitsu is weight cutting. So I've like towards the end of this year, I'm going to be looking to compete again at about 66 kilos. Yep. But I want to make sure that I'm actually doing it. Um, the right way. Yeah, the right way, like where I'm actually going to be like, you know, um, like physically healthy. So one, so it, you can certainly live like a like a healthy lifestyle as a vegetarian. Mm. Yep. Um, the question's going to be is like looking into um, what I can do to actually cut that weight down yep. and still stay healthy. So um, from a, are, are you, do you take any supplements? Like are you? Um, yeah, so I do. So I take a mix of supplements like um, taking like uh, iron, magnesium, zinc. Yep. Um, one of them that I actually do take, which is technically not veg, well, it isn't vegetarian, but like it's, is our fish oil. Yep. Just because to my understanding, it's really, really difficult to get omega-3 from yep. um, other sources. Exactly. Like, sources. like exactly yep. from like, like plant-based sources. Just uh, I, to my understanding, like the, the human body does is really, really inefficient mm. at converting um, like foods, like or like you know plant-based foods into omega three. While like I, I, to my understanding, I think like fish have already done that. Essentially, mm. I think uh, to get the same amount of omega three from one fish oil tablet, you've got to drink like half a liter of this. Uh, this I think like this algae <laughs> liquid, spirulina of juice or something. Yeah, something yeah. like that. Like so, so fish oil is like what like a recent one for me that I that I take now. Um, just because like you've just got to find some level of balance. Yep. And and so I know, so you've got to, you use a whoop strap, don't you? I do, yeah. Yeah. So I've got the aura ring, but yeah, they're essentially very similar, but obviously, you know, you can't really wear the aura ring when you're training jujitsu. It's not, no. not ideal. I, actually, it's um, when I lived in Canberra, one of, uh, the, I think it was the principal of the school actually is missing his ring finger because uh, he actually had a ring on and it got caught in one of those like automatic basketball Ugh. nets that like when they were going up and his finger got caught in it. So yeah, I think wearing a ring while doing jiu-jitsu is <laughs> not a smart idea. <laughs> no, definitely not. So then um, what other things do you track? Do you, do you, do you get like uh, your bloods taken to look at, you know, what your vitamin levels sure. are? And so like so I'm going to go do some blood work recently. Um, one of the things I had come, like happening probably – um, towards the end of last year, beginning of this year was I was just getting a lot of um, additional sort of niggling injuries and like old injuries weren't going away. So what I did was I just like shifted up my diet a bit, um, like went back to eating meat to sort of like see how I felt. Now, um, I did that in a very unscientific way where I just went like bro science did and went, oh, I'll just start eating meat and see how I feel. Yep. When really what I should have done was I should have gone and gotten some blood work done and checked, um, yeah. and just actually looked if I was deficient in anything, but I just did it the bro science way. Yep. Um, but now like I'm back to eating uh, like, like a vegetarian diet and what I'm going to do is actually do it the right way, get some blood work done, see what I'm deficient in mm. um, and see what I need to adjust. Yep. Like I, yeah, it was just like a complete bro science approach yep. to uh, looking at my diet. I, don't, I, I think that's how 99% of the world approaches diet right like yeah exactly they <laughs> just go oh i feel good doing this but like yeah. they don't realize there might be like creeping problems that come up over time so yeah yeah so that's something i i want to take a, a better approach to yep. going forward yeah like, like getting more blood work done and even like getting blood work done regularly, regularly. just to like yep. because i know one of the big things um particularly with a vegetarian diet is 
iron and iron um to my understanding has like quite a short i guess half-life i'm not sure what the term is they use technically mm. but like it it can like your your iron levels fluctuate quite a fair bit because mm. like it's it's something that doesn't stay in your system very well. very yeah. long so you got to be like pretty consistent with making sure that you're uh you're you know you've got a constant getting, intake of iron exactly yeah. yeah so so i to my understanding like the blood work might not necessarily reflect your iron levels appropriately like it might show that like you know you've got like you know reasonably decent like iron levels and you're in like a normal range but that might be like you know because you've just recently had had something but maybe like across like a longer period of time like you're not maintaining certain iron levels that you should have yeah i think that's where you know the consistency of the blood work like you 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 do you do a test once you're all you're seeing is that snapshot in time exactly right but if you do it consistently over time then you can actually see okay it's like uh, the way i would put it is like you know, um, typically when, you know, people are working towards a weight cut, then, then they, they're checking their weight, you know. Absolutely. Um, and so then, you know, um, even between if, you, if you're not consistent with when you check your weight, your weight fluctuates as well. Like if I weigh myself first thing in the morning versus when I weigh myself in the, in the evening, I've got two totally different weights. Absolutely. So, so it's, you know, I, I could either then say that, hey, I fluctuate a lot or the, the, smarter thing, the smarter approach would be then to obviously consistently weigh myself at the same time. Right, so if you want to actually have a proper baseline, you need to have that that consistency, right? Absolutely. So yeah, I, I, I think that's definitely a smart approach to how you approach the the um, the, the blood work side of things. Yeah. So that, that's that's the plan going forward is like to, yep. to have a more scientific approach to these things. Yep. I also the other thing that I'll, I'm, I've been curious about, um, I've been wanting to do it myself because I think there's like you know similar to like one of those twenty three and Me kits where yep. you know they they do the DNA check and they can actually tell you like what foods. Uh, your body responds better to have you have you done anything like that i haven't actually um i was interested in doing it one of the things that they used to do but i think they couldn't get at least in the u.s is like fda regulation or like fda certified um with the like the 23 and me and like different like uh similar things is um because they used to be able to give you like like medical information based on your genetics like whether or not like you were uh, predisposed to like exactly like certain things um i don't know how that would go in australia like i haven't looked too much into it i just know that like you no longer can get that information um from these companies in the u.s so so i want to find out if that's possible in australia to do that or if there's like somewhere else you can go to yeah to do that the only thing Um, i'd I'd, I'd think of like you know tinfoil hat going on here is you know give them a fake name (laughs) give them a fake birthday because last thing you want is then they've got all this information on what you're you're predisposed to and then suddenly you're getting your medical insurance declined because they're like nah mate you know dna says that you're gonna have a heart attack and you know you're fucked (laughs) That's actually a really good point there because, like, I'm I'm not a big conspiracy person, but I think the one place where it's, like, there's you, – you can be damn sure that there's, like, certain conspiracies going like that is, like, with, like, health insurance. Like, yeah. they'll do anything they can to not pay out on, like, any sort of, uh, I guess, claim you make. Like, yeah. they, like, they're in the business of making sure that they don't pay out on claims. Yeah, absolutely. So – and and so one of the other things that just I just was reminded of, you've got a couple of jiu-jitsu injuries, right? Yeah, I've got quite a few. Yep. And so – um. Okay, well, let, let, let's. What was the first one? Um, first major one I can think of um, was blue belt. I actually, it's probably, I wouldn't say the most traumatic. But or I, I guess it depends on how you look at it. Um, is that I have in both my knees, like I have like my knees lock up, and so that started happening at blue belt. And this was before I was even playing like locks. This was um. I believe it's a result of like meniscus tears in both of my knees. Mm -hmm. Um, Mainly happens uh, with my right knee. Um, Still happens even now. Um, But my, like both my knees lock up. And so that's a result, I think, mainly from playing De La Hiva. Like, and so that'll still happen if I'm playing like a lot of De La Hiva and rolling. Yeah. Where basically I've got like a, like a partially rotated leg and it's starting to load up like that. It causes like the meniscus to like, I guess like, like the part that might be torn to like flip over and catch Catch, uh, in the joint. Yeah. So I've had surgery for that but it hadn't really solved the issue like yep. i got um like a, a bilateral like um arthroscopy like mm. like just uh like cleaned it a, up yeah we'll, we'll try to clean it up um i don't know how good i, I don't think they they did a particularly effective job <laughs> i think they even said afterwards they couldn't really find like what they were looking for yep um in my knees so so that's probably the, right the so more, they just went in there <laughs> yes. around. so so in, exactly like essentially <laughs> like um like so so that's probably the more like I guess traumatic injury, not in the sense that the injury itself is traumatic, but in terms of like, you know, having to spend like quite a fair bit of money getting like the surgery and things done just for like, like, which is like, I guess like 
reasonably invasive. Yeah. Um, just to not really have an, uh, not really to have any sort of like closure Outcome. or result on it. Yep. Yeah. So that's some um, that's an issue that still bothers me now. So that probably happened like early on blue belt days from playing like a lot of De La Hiva at the time. Yep. Um. Yeah. So that's probably like the, the most frustrating one. Yep. And so, like, when, when it came to that, so w- was that, did you try and put that through health insurance or anything, or was that something that you had to pay out of pocket for? Um, I think it was a combination of both. Okay. Like, uh, I think that the big thing with that, um, and I think, like, this is, like, a, this this might be, like, one of the differences between, like, uh, I guess, medical care in Australia versus the US is getting, um, like, a good, uh, uh, what are they called, um, Anesthetologist, uh, anesthetologist, yeah, the, yeah, the guys that put the the, the anesthetic in, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I, I think just like access to like 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 a anesthetologist, like that's uh, I guess like you know competent, like like they, yeah. I think they're like fewer and far between in Australia compared to the US, okay. to my understanding. Yep. Um, actually, a friend of mine um, that I used to train with in Newcastle, I think he actually moved to the US to do that exact like that exact job over in the US just because it pays yep. so much better. Yeah. Well there's only I, I know one guy um who's an anesthetist. Um he's actually he's been on my podcast before, but he was actually yeah, grew up in the States as well. Um but lives here now and that's you know what he does for, for, for work. Also trains jujitsu and um yeah, but yeah. Actually, you said anesthetist. I think anesthetist is the Australian way of saying it. I think anesthetologist is the American, American name way. for it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So you, you know, I can't say that I know anyone else that's in that field of work, but yeah, he's the only one that I can that I, that I've ever met. I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like, so I think just like there's just like they can just get paid so much better in the US. So I think a lot of them end up moving to the US. It's okay. Yeah. Um, and as, because I think it's like a lot of extra years of study compared to like becoming like, I guess like a GP or even like yeah. a surgeon. Like I think it's like really quite specialized training. It is. Yeah. So it went, like when Mark did the podcast with me, I was asking him about it. And one of the things he was saying was like, um, you, you, the way uh, the analogy he used was like, you know, if you're a, a, a fighter pilot, right, you have specific sequences that you need to go through you know, when you're going to land the plane. Um, so even just say, like, you're going to land on a on one of those, you know, aircraft carriers with where, where they've got to hit the hooks and things like that. Yep. So he was saying, like, you know, they've got um, a specific set of sequences that you have to think about. And then you've also got um, – they drill your plan B into your head, you know, because it's like, okay, if you go and administer the block and then now you've got to do um, – the heart rate goes below this certain level, you know, you're basically you're, – you're, you know, it could be seconds or minutes away from – having something catastrophic happening. Yep. So so he was saying, like, the training that they give you is so regimented in the sense that, um, you know, you've got to go through all of these steps. You've got your checklist of the things that you need to do. And then after you've finished your checklist, then you've got to have your plan B for that. If, if that doesn't work out or something starts to go astray, that you straight away move into your next thing so you don't think about it. Yep. Yeah, so it's it's pretty um, – obviously, it's, it's quite intense. And I think um, – uh, like I think you know, the, it, it, yeah. In, in those situations where you're, you're dealing with a heavy, heavy customer well, duty of you know care uh, for your patients and things like that, absolutely, you need to have be you, you'd want to have that drilled in, right? Like the last thing you want is to have a, a, an anesthetist who's just like, yeah, yeah, you'll be right, and then oh shit, <laughs> you know. Exactly. I think I've, exp- I, I've I've dealt with some GPs that are probably a bit more like that, where they're like, oh yeah, that'll be fine, and then like you know you like you're looking at like you know say like a massive staph infection on your leg and like yeah. it's like absolutely killing you you can't walk and they're like yeah just give it a couple of days and see how it is it's yeah, it like, doesn't work like that no <laughs> <laughs> yeah I've, I've, one of, I've had one of my mates um he had staph and then it then it became cellulitis so it went under the the fat or whatever yep and it just like you know um he was trying to do a weight cut for a fight and it, and like yeah it just destroyed him like you know yep. you're getting on the antibiotics and then he ballooned up like he he, he was like his face just became like a fishbowl because yep. he retained that much water. And then it was like, okay, no, you can't fight. You need to call that off. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't think he was ever really the same since. Like he had like a hole in his leg and they had to pack it and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. I've, I've got um like a scar on the inside of my, my left leg, just like from where it was like, like l- in 24 hours, it like got underneath, I guess like the fat Ugh. there and they had to like, like cut it out. I remember, um I remember actually having to like go to the doctor, like where they went to drain it. Cause I think she gave me, Actually, I think in, in 24 hours, it like ballooned up like that. But then I was on antibiotics straight away. But even like a week later, there was still like, like something the there and everything like yep. underneath. So like, I remember having to go back to the doctor. They had to like, Lancet. 
Well, yeah, exactly. They had to they had to cut it open and drain all of the pus and fluid out. And I remember the doctor looking at that and going, okay, and I think that's like a fatty layer of tissue underneath there. And she's like, I'll just get another doctor to come in and get a second opinion. Other doctor comes in and goes, nah, there's more of that there. And like, so she had to like, basically she had to um, put in local anesthetic to cut it open. <laughs> but then because it was, it was, it was so deep into my leg that when she went the second go at cutting it open, like the, the local anesthetic wasn't like affecting Enough. that part of it. So yeah. like, like it was like just soaring into my leg, oh. like to cut it out. And it was like, so it was just excruciating. Yeah. And like, you could like just see into my leg where she'd like cut yeah. it all open. And so I got like a nice scar there from uh, when they did all that. Yep. Good times. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's never uh, – and especially because you're awake to see it. You, you're watching it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and the first part would have been okay because it just would have felt surreal because you couldn't feel it. Yeah, exactly. Like, it just felt like it was like there was some pressure on the top of my leg and, yep. like, you know, I could, like, just see everything come out, of, like, come out of it. But then the second go, like, I could feel, like, she was basically having to, like, soar into it with, like, the knife, oh. like, 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 sort of, like, like you know, yeah. jabbing it, like, back and forth, like, to, like, cut across, like, the, the, oh. the tissue there. And, and I could really feel that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's never going to end well. No, that yeah. was not fun. No, I can imagine. All right, so let's um, let's go back to where we were in the timeline. So you've come back from from um, from the UK. Um, so then, when you came back to Australia, um, fresh from the UK, um, what did you end up doing? You you obviously then went back to training, right? Yeah, yeah. So I went back to training. Um, as like as soon as I could, like I got back. I hadn't trained for like six months. Um, so it was you know uh, much needed to get back into it. I think as well, like just six months in the UK was also just like a physically unhealthy experience for yeah. me. So, so getting back into getting back into training was much needed. Um, at that time I was sort of evaluating what I was doing. So I was looking, I was looking at the time potentially to go to university. So I started doing a, like a course, like a, just a bridging course to get into uni. Cause yep. I didn't apply to anything outside of high school. Yep. Like, like I didn't apply to anything out of high school and I didn't like, so I didn't defer or anything like that. Yep. So it meant that because I had, I'd had, so much time off since when I finished high school and like coming back, I, I think you have, I think you have like up to 12 months, I think to yep. apply for university. Yep. Um, otherwise you've got to do like a bridging, bridging course, course. To, yeah. to get back into uni. So I didn't apply for anything in that 12 months. So I started doing a bridging course to get into uni. Um, and I think I got, I, I did that for about nine months while working at the same time, but I wasn't particularly focused on it. And I still had no idea of what I wanted to do by yep. the time I got to the end of the course. I was thinking about maybe either doing mathematics or nursing. Yep. I wanted to do mathematics, um, like as I do now, but I considered doing nursing just because of like more job opportunity as a result. Sure. But in the end of it, I decided just to like stop doing it because like I wasn't particularly interested um, interested in doing either one of those things, like in studying just yet. Yep. Um. So I just focused on working and just doing jujitsu. Yep. Okay. And so what were you? What was? What were you working as? Then um, I think at the time, what what was I doing? I was like the, um, like the the area manager for this inventory accounting company. So, so I started doing that. Um, I was the, the youngest guy, like, like, um, or at least like the youngest, uh, supervisor on the team. And so I ended up like, just ended up basically, uh, being like the head of like the, the supervisors for the Newcastle area. So like just organizing all the major, major jobs and everything that we had to do through that, like, um, like any time, like any major stores or anything like that had to do like, you know, their quarterly, like inventory accounts, anything like that, just organizing the teams for that. Like, so running like a, like a 40 person team, for like that sort yep. of thing. Like it, it wasn't like a super involved job, um, but I enjoyed it. But like, it was uh, like the hours for it were just like all over the place. Yep. Um, and like, it could be quite, quite long hours, like, like a shift sometimes ended up being like 14, 15, 16 hours. Yep. Okay. And then, so what, um, what made you so? Were, were you when you first started in jiu jitsu? Were you did you start competing straight away, or what? When was your first comp? I my first competition. I think it was towards the end of white belt. So I think I was seventeen at the time. Yep. Um. Like like so I was in the uh, I think what's that the juvenile division mm -hmm. like white belt. Um. So so I competed. I think only once at white belt, but then I competed a lot at blue belt. Um. And I was not good. Mm -hmm. Like like what competing. Um. I I don't think I actually won any of the divisions. Actually, sorry. My first competition I did, what did I get? I think I got gold in the gi 
but it was the worst jujitsu match of all time. <laughs> it was just I had closed guard, barely trying to hold on. I think I tried to go for an armbar at one stage and I got one advantage. Yeah. And so it was only me and this one other kid in my division. Um, so I got gold as a result of one advantage and it was probably the most boring match yeah. um, of all just time. Just stalled out for five yeah, minutes and exactly. then last, last oh. 20 seconds. <laughs> exactly. It was literally just holding on to closed guard for as long as possible and like I tried to do one armbar. And honestly... Getting that advantage was the ref being very generous. I think he just didn't want to make a decision at the end of the match. He thought, I'll just give this kid an advantage because like, at least that way it makes my job easier. easier. Yeah, he doesn't think about it. Exactly. Like, like, because outside of that, I don't think anything happened. Yeah. Um, I remember Nogi Division. I, I remember, I think I won my first Nogi match 12-0. Um, I, I think it was 12-0, but I was so gassed out. I had a fully locked rear naked choke and I just could Couldn't not finish, finish it. it. My arm, my arms were just absolutely yep. jelly at Toast. that stage. And then I think in the the, the finals match, um, I got arm triangled, I think, in about a minute yep. by this other kid. Okay. And then do you remember what your um what was your like what was your mindset going into that? Because, you know, I always find it interesting, you know, when you do your first comp, everybody's generally shit scared. Yep. Um, you know, you got nerves. You got the whole gambit thing. Some people find it hard to, to sleep. Some people are okay. Um, I, I try and take the approach of, you know, I don't. I try not to think about comps basically until the day that they're on. Yeah. Maybe, I don't know whether that's the right or wrong pr- approach, but that's just the approach that I like. Um, so, I, you know, in the pre-COVID experience, I was always the late sign-up. Like I would always sign up last minute. So I don't have to think about it. My, my mentality was that, you know, if you're always training, you're, you're technically always ready anyway. Yeah. Um, that would be how I approached it. But what, what, what do you remember of your mindset going into your first comp? Honestly, I I don't think I really had much of a mindset going into it. I just thought like, oh, I'll just do this because I guess that's what people in jiu-jitsu do. <laughs> like um, I remember uh, one of the guys that really helped me out when I was starting, um, starting out in jiu-jitsu is uh, Dan Ireland. So he still trains. He's a black belt now. Um, and we, we trained together again relatively recently i think a couple of months ago after like not training with each other for i think maybe six years yep um or like maybe even seven years actually um but so dan took me for the, to my first competition and so he was like he competed quite a fair bit um through white belt so dan was a white belt at the time but to me he was the guy that like competed a lot like yep. and like knew sort of what was going on because where i was training at the time there really wasn't anyone that was really competing yeah. all that much but okay. like you know uh, dan was uh really really helpful there and like so um, he, I think he had a better mindset for competition, like in terms of like, I guess like he knew what the experience was like and like at least trying to prepare himself for competition at the time and was trying to take a more measured approach to it while sort of just like, I don't know what I'm in for. I'm just going to turn up and see how I go. Yep. And then, so, um, when you think about subsequent competitions, right. Um, did your, did your, um, your approach to it in terms of mindset, has that changed? Yeah, no, it, it, it definitely has changed over time. Like, I think uh, one of the big things is like even if you're not having a more measured approach to what you're doing, just with the experience, you have a better understanding of how you feel and what makes you feel good leading up to competition. Yeah. Um, I think it took me a little while. I, I think it wasn't until later Blue Belt where it was actually the first time where I really tried to prepare for a competition. Yep. And so was that through um, obviously, you know, you guys set up like a bit more of a, a camp for, for the comp or? Um, not even that. It was – um. It was for a grappling industries, I think. And, like, I think uh, because I was, like, I'd been training for about four or five years at the time. Um, and this is essentially how I got into leg locks. Mm. was just the first time I had a competition where I went, oh, there's this element of this competition where I just don't know anything about it. I need to actually do some training from these positions mm. to get comfortable with it. And that was because, like, you know, it was the first competition I was doing that had heel hooks, toe holds, knee bars. Like, I think I'd only ever done competitions with straight full hooks in it before. Yep. And then for the no-gi, like, you know, this was the first competition where they actually had heel hooks in. Yep. And and so, like, I was going from, you know, only doing straight full locks to, you know, doing straight full locks, toe holds, knee bars, and everything. heel hooks. Yep. Like, like, everything was thrown in. And so it was the first time I really had to, like, you know, actually prepare for a competition because, like, it was a couple of months or I think, yeah, it was a couple of months away and I, I had to ask my coach, um, Luke Besson at the time, like, hey, I've got this competition coming up. How do I, like, like I've never done heel hooks before. Like, what do I do? And so, mm. and so one of my teammates Keon um I think he was a brown belt at the time he's a black belt now um Luke, Luke said to me I'll oh, just do rounds with Keon then like like Keon's you know does heel hooks he like does like foot locks and yep. so just do Learn. training with him and like like yep. just work out what you can like like 
at the time because of, I guess, like this is how jujitsu was for everyone at the time is like no one was really doing heel hooks mm. at the gym. Yep. Like, like, like no gym was doing heel hooks at the time. It's, um, and so Luke even at the time like had a policy like, you know, okay, like, you know, brown and black belts can do heel hooks if they agree with it with each other. Mm. And so th- at the time I was a blue belt, but he, and he said, okay, I'll make an exception then like, like, you know, if, if you if you're doing heel hooks with Keon, like that's okay. Yep. Um, and if any of the other brown belts or black belts want to do them with you, but even then, like like so, Luke was okay with it. And I think actually it's interesting because because um, Luke doesn't focus on jujitsu competition. Like Luke is a like you know Luke Beston uh, is a black belt under Hoist Gracie. So Luke's an overall martial arts nerd. And I actually think because of the fact that he was um you know a hoist Gra- he's a hoist gracie affiliate is why they actually do heel hooks yeah while like if you went to an ibjf school they you don't do done any, it. you wouldn't done any yep. heel hooks but but heel hooks is actually a part of like the the gracie self-defense curriculum so i think like i was really fortunate in that regard mm. that even though i wasn't training at a competition-based school um that i actually had an advantage there in the fact that luke was like willing to let us do heel hooks because it's already a part of like the self-defense curriculum yeah and so Luke's and Luke himself is very, very open-minded to, to all of jiu-jitsu and also all martial arts. So I was, I'm very fortunate in that regard that, like, you know, I had that opportunity there to actually work on that. Yeah. Because I think that's really what led to just me where I am today. Yeah. So so that was, you know, I think that was the niche, right? So, um, you know, you, you, you then obviously done a, a, a camp that was more, you know, specific training yeah. focused it, around that. It, it, it probably makes it sound more glamorous than what it was rather than it was simply me turning up and just early to cl- and, yeah. me turning up to class every day and yep. just getting beaten up for an hour by <laughs> Keon and then doing regular training with the rest of like the yep. rest of the classes and stuff like but I guess like like for me at the time like that was closer to like a like actually having like preparation for a comp than anything I'd done before rather than simply I just sign up and I turn up and hope for the best yeah and so then did that impact your mindset when you turned up to that comp were you now thinking okay this is my I have a strategy this is my plan well, I, I think what it led to was um, I turned up as the only guy, I think, in my division that was actually prepared for heel hooks and, and, and like, toe holds and knee bars. So I actually ended up just winning all my matches by, mm. like, you know, with leg locks. Yep. Um, and, and that was actually probably the first time where I'd, I'd say, like, actually, other than, like, that really shitty match that I had in the gear at, like, white belt, <laughs> I think that was the first time I'd actually gotten a gold medal at blue belt like i i think i'd lost almost every single match at blue belt up until that point mm. and then like i was just doing leg locks and like i won every single match at blue belt yep yep okay and so yeah so one of the things i always think about um like all, a lot of the times when when i've lost it's almost like i brought in this this level of complacency where it's just like i'm just going to turn up and then i'll just you know we'll see where the match goes and then wh- wherever it goes will determine what my strategy is and you know it's it's it, I, I think it's a very complacent strategy and it never never really worked for me it, it, where it's worked for me you know i've always competed at my best where if i've come in and i'm going okay if my goal is to if it's you know my goal is to submit the other person i need to put that fear of the submission into them yep. to then uh, allow me to 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 do everything else that i want to do yep. um and so you know like i i, I think there's you, you need to have a and I, I think it's different for everybody but i think there is also a specific mindset that each person is going to operate the best under um, yep. under those conditions, right? Yeah. Um, like, like I'm, that's something I'm working through with, uh, with a student at the moment is, is exactly that is, uh, preparation for competition. Like, like he has aspirations to like, you know, at least get better results in competition than what he's currently got. Um, so what we're doing is working on that. And one of the big things is, uh, you know, uh, complacency and making sure that from each position, even if your opponent is doing nothing, you know how you're going to initiate the action from those positions. And I think that's really, really important for competition. Mm. Like if you look at someone like Gordon Ryan, for example, he has got um, methods for every sort of like, like, like to to approach a position, no matter what sort of like pacing the the match is at. Like typically, what you'll see with Gordon is like early on in matches, particularly when either the score is like even mm. or if he's ahead on points, he's generally playing quite reactive, mm. um, but still like with a level of urgency. Like, for example, like, he, like you know, he's going to let people like come in towards him so he can attack, but he's still trying to initiate first and a lot of setups. But what you'll see with Gordon Ryan is that as soon as he's on the back foot in any capacity, 
his level of urgency shoots through the roof yeah. and he begins to work nonstop until he can regain advantage Tempo. in the match. Exactly. Yeah. Whether it's going to be regaining like control of the match or whether it's going to be regaining like lost points. Yep. You'll see him work nonstop to get ahead. Like he will adjust his pace. And what you see from him there is from every single situation, um, he can either play reactive or he can play active. And so so with that, I think it's important like to have like a really active game. Like I like or at least have the capacity for an active game. Mm. I think you can play reactive if you have the ability to play active as well. Yeah. I, yeah. I you can't do one without the other because if you're down in points and then you want to play a reactive well, game, the other yeah. guy can just stall you out. And, and I think that's what you <laughs> see uh, see a lot with a lot of high level guys is that for the most part like like high level competitors at least like you look at like someone like the Mendes brothers, they have a very active game and I think you can play an active game without a reactive game because, like, if you get on the back foot, you just kill, still keep, like, attacking and, like, like trying to stay active from each of these positions. But I think if you want to play a reactive game, you need to have an active game in your back pocket. Yep. Um, and I think that's really good for competition because, like, just for that very reason. So what you'll see with Gordon Ryan is that from all of these positions, what will happen is, is if he's on the back foot and he's got an opponent that's going to stall on him because they know that they're ahead on points... He has the ability to to not just like over like you know overcome their react like sorry their, their their passiveness, but also like even the ability to overcome them actively trying to disengage so that yeah. way he can get ahead and keep attacking. Yeah. Um, and I and I think it's like people lack that in competition. Like they're used to sort of uh you know people sort of letting them have things or like you know like in training and people sort of like half assing their attacks yeah. on them, which gives them a chance to counter attack rather than focusing on like trying to initiate and trying to like you know gain like the setups first yeah i think that's uh, i would liken that that sort of mentality of gordon's kind of like to to khabib you yeah. know because khabib is like you know he he always wants to dominate you know he always yeah. wants to win the scrambles you know you never see him really ever be lazy in a in a scramble if it's a scramble he's chain wrestling he's on top of you he's sucking you in he's drawing you in he's you know trying to use that to his advantage yeah and and I think that that actually I think that's a reason why you know those guys they break people you know, they break people mentally. Actually, it's interesting on that as well because um I, I think uh, John Danaher on the Joe Rogan podcast was talking about the differences between uh, Habib Nurmagomedov and Conor McGregor is how um, Conor plays quite a reactive game, mm. like but he's not necessarily letting the other person initiate, but he's letting them start moving first, but yep. he's still going to dominate the striking exchange. Yep, like he's still going to control that position while like. Um, Habib like actively works towards like you know being able to strike or wrestle and how like and, and I think John did like a really interesting job of breaking down like how he thinks that match could potentially go one way or the other yeah um, but like that's a great example then I guess of like you know two different styles of games like not yep. and not necessarily striking versus wrestling but yep. like active versus reactive Active. yeah yeah absolutely so then you know when it when it comes to then performing at, at, at bigger bigger and bigger comps right um, did that um, was there any nervousness in your mindset or how did you approach it? Um, I think I've become more relaxed over time, honestly. Yep. Um, I think, uh, I, I think maybe like I used to get more nervous. I think as soon as I started finding like an initial success in competition, um, I, I became a lot more relaxed over time. One of my big problems early on in competition was I would get such a bad adrenaline dump and I would tunnel vision so badly mm. that like I just lost like sort of, any control over like how I was going to like behave in the match. Yep. But now it's the complete opposite. I, I think like when I walk out into a, into a match, I don't get any adrenaline. I might get like, I think the most adrenaline I'll get leading up to a match is maybe like the night before when I'm like having a shower mm. and I'm like, like, because I've got time to think mm. and I'm like thinking about like how the match is going to play out. Yep. And I, I, I remember like my last match, that's probably when I had like a small adrenaline dump is literally just like standing in the shower thinking about the setups for the match. Yep. And that was about it. Yep. Um, but like the moment, like w when I compete, the moment I walk out onto the mats, I, I have a clear head. Like I'm not, th I, I try and stay in the moment. Exactly. Like I, I stay, I, I stay very much in the moment. Like, like whether it's on like a big stage, whether it's on like Polaris or like up in Queensland when I was competing on classic, like, like where there's like a big audience for these events. Yep. I find that really doesn't affect me all that much. Mm. Um, yeah, like I, I I feel pretty comfortable either way. Yep. Okay. And so then, um, what what? So I'm just going to go back to the to sure. the timeline here. But then, um, at what point then did you decide, hey, uh, I need to make a move, or you know, how how did that move to absolute happen? Sure. So so that was um, I, I was competing a lot, and I and I realized that like I wanted to either I was either going to join the military. Yep. Or go all in on jujitsu. 
Okay. Um, but living in Newcastle, like you could train every single night, but like you didn't have the ability to like um, train during the day or train full time or anything like that. Um, actually, sorry, I'll take that back a little bit earlier. Um, I had a match in Sydney against Mikhail Yahaya, mm-hmm. um, who's one of my teammates now. Um, and he just after the match, we had a really good match. I think Mikhail won by decision. Um, that match and afterwards he just invited me to come down and just train with him in Melbourne he's like yeah just come visit he's like this is where I train he's like you can crash on the couch and I thought oh that'd be fun like there's something cool to do yep so I visited Melbourne and I I saw how they were training at absolute because this is um when, when I went down to visit initially um Craig was preparing for EBI I think he was about two weeks away from competing on EBI for the first time and this was before he actually had the match against Leandro Lowe. Yep. So so at this stage, Giles had competed once on EBI. I think he competed on EBI 5 where he um, he submitted Nathan Orchard and Hani Yaya on EBI before losing to Gary Tonin. Mm-hmm. Um, and so so Giles had already competed once um, on EBI. Um, I think he'd also already been to ADCC once before, so yep. with Craig. Yep. And now this is when Craig was preparing for EBI for the first time. And so Craig went on to... I think he also fought Nathan Orchard and then also Dara O'Connell before losing to Wagner Hosher in the semifinals of EBI. Yep. Um, so so the reason why it's important to, to just mention the EBI part was because uh, when I went down to Melbourne to visit them, this is when they were doing a lot of the overtime positional yep. training. Positional rounds. Exactly. And so that was the first time I'd really been exposed to that and like the type of training they were doing because I, cause it makes sense. Like you go, okay, like you do like some rounds from the back. We weren't really doing that up in Newcastle, but then they were also doing like rounds from like saddle, for example, which mm. I hadn't seen before. Like, yep. like, and it makes sense. Like, it, like in hindsight, like I think people probably look at that and they go, "Oh, we'll obviously do positional rounds from like these positions," but I, that's like that wasn't something that was particularly widespread. I think actually, even even Lachlan, he wasn't doing he wasn't running positional tra- uh, rounds for his own training until like him and Liv had gone over and lived in Brazil for a little while and they saw how they were training over at Alliance over there yep. and that's like some of the things that he brought back to Australia. Yep. So and that was, that was long before I I mm. visited Absolute but so I think people don't realize that like you know maybe it's more commonplace now to do a lot of positional yeah. training within gyms but like if you go back maybe six or seven years, at least in Australia, yeah, it wasn't. doing positional training wasn't yeah. actually all that common amongst different gyms. That's something that's only really been more, yeah, it's a more yeah. recent sort of innovation. Exactly. But I, I wonder, I think that's probably part of the EBI influence, right? Like when you I, have, I think so. When you have these specific overtime rounds, um, of course, you know, like in a, in, in a regulation, t- in the regulation time, anything can happen in that match, right? But then if you, if you th- are able to, pres- um, to, to perform at the highest levels in those positional rounds, yeah. You can then, you know, earn your way to the to the to the title, really. Absolutely. Yeah. And actually one of the big things on the positional training rounds with that is that it wasn't simply just have this position and like, you know, try and win from there. Yeah. It was also like varying the victory conditions. So for example for example, one of the things Lachlan and Craig used to do from like Saddle, for example, was that, you know, you, you would simply look to control your opponent from saddle for as long as possible and not submit them. Yep. So like not just simply, oh, we start in saddle. It's like, okay, like how fast can we get to get a heel hook? hook? It's yeah. like, it, it's the opposite. Yep. You don't get to heel hook them. You just have to hold them hold there them as there. long as possible. And, and so take turns. Yep. Exactly. And so I think that translates across really well, um, or at least like the idea of that translates across really well. Cause that's something that I implement a lot more in my teachings now is, and, and not strictly speaking that, but more different ideas. Like one good one, for example, is uh, like, let's say if we want to do saddle again, talking about that, yep. the person defending mm. is not allowed to clear the position. Okay, like so they've got to stay in that. They've got to stay in the, they got to stay in the position and get comfortable defending the in the hook. position there. Yep. Exactly. Like, so they've got to get used to like slipping the heel slip, hook. Toe slip. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Like, like, like different ways of defending and not simply just spin out as fast as possible yep. and clear and from explode. the position. Yeah, exactly. And it gives the person attacking as well a chance to actually work on like, okay, this control slows them down this way. Like, this is what I can do to stop them from like, you know, turning in this direction gives them a chance to work. Similarly speaking, like another one that we did recently as well was um, starting in an armbar, mm. but the person attacking the armbar isn't allowed to finish the armbar. They can get to the armbar, yep. like they can extend the, they, they, they can hold the, like, you know, control yeah. the wrist and things, yep. but they can't like, like, you know, put Use, pressure on. Yeah. So then did they have to transition to like triangle or something else or is it no, just... No, 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 just simply I'll controlling just it for as long as possible. possible. And, and so the goal behind that was to get the person defending comfortable with going into hitchhikers and yep. things like that. Yeah. Because one of the big problems you'll find with someone defending a, an armbar is that in training, most people rip on an armbar as fast as possible. Yeah. So 
you don't really have a chance to you build up reps. Com- exactly. Yeah. You don't have a chance to build up confidence in your hitchhiker because you go, okay, I'm going to go for this hitchhiker once. Oh, my arm's breaking. And <laughs> so really what you, like a lot of people end up doing is focusing on tapping as fast as they can as soon as their arms extended rather than feeling like they're, they're in a safe training environment and they mm. have a chance to work through an escape. Yep. And really like people go, oh, well, that's silly then like because that's unrealistic. But really what it means then is the person attacking as well builds up confidence in their finish yeah, because because yeah. one of the big big problems people have with training is that they're looking for a tap mm. and a tap's okay but like that doesn't translate across into a break in competition yeah because what you need for a break in competition is sustained control to yeah. have like a follow through on a break and yeah. be able to hold that break for an extended period of time yeah it's the it's feeding the ego versus actually developing the the position absolutely and and so other ways that we'll positional train now as well is like say for example will start from mount. Mm. But your goal isn't to stay in mount. Your goal is to stay past the guard. Mm. Your goal like so we'll start we'll do positional training starting in mount, for example. And your the, the goal as the top player starting in mount is to submit your opponent. Mm. Whether that means you take their back, you rock go for rolling front headlocks from mounted position. Yep. Whether or not you enter into saddle from mount, like 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 you just keep going until you can submit them. Yep. Person on bottom, their whole goal is to either fully recover their guard with both legs back in front of them. Yep. Or get up. Exactly. Or stand up. Yep. And like, but like not just like stand up. They actually need to stand up and disengage mm. to a neutral position. Yep. Um, and and then as well as like if they can reverse the position, gain yep. top position, or if they can submit, submit their opponent. The yep. So so that way the idea there is that you know like you can start using mount as like a strong position to start setting up a variety of attacks because yep. people don't feel all that comfortable attacking from mount and like fair enough but what we want to do is like develop um mount attacks that lead to pathways to the back for yep. example yep. like like you don't have to actually like just go like you know from just mount, submit from mount, mount attack yeah yeah cuz like if it's Get competition the arm across you know yeah plenty of other movements you can transition to exactly like like if it's competition you've already scored your points yep and one of the bi- one of the big advantages from mount is like it's just easier to stay past someone's guard from there. Mm. Um, but really, like like for sub only, like if you're past someone's guard, like you want to use that whole position past their guard to attack. Yeah. Not just like the one fixed pin from the top position. Yeah, absolutely. And so it means then, like you know, if like you start like dismounting to knee ride to create opportunities. Mm. Actually, th- on that as well, actually one of the re- one of the other reasons I actually like doing the positional training from mount that way is that in the room at grappling education, like for example we'll have people that are 55 kilos and mm. we have some people that are 140 kilos. <laughs> now, do you think a 55 kilo person can hold down a 140 kilo person for a mount? Nope. Probably not. <laughs> Their best opportunity is to actually create movement and opportunities yeah. for themselves. by like, get say, to the back. Yeah. Exactly. Go to knee ride. Like it creates like an extended limb as the person tries to escape, exposes yep. the neck, exposes the back. Like, so even though, like, I'd say typically if you can hold someone in a pin, you want to minimize movement. Mm. I'd say when there's such a size discrepancy like that, movement's probably an advantage to the to the, the smaller small player. Yep. Yeah. The speed, right? Yeah. Actually, on, on that note, right, like, um, I, I just thought of something in the sense of, you know, you've also competed um, at higher weight categories and given up weight, weight advantages and obviously competed in um, absolute divisions and things like that. Yep. You know, how... In, in terms of your approach to those matches, you know, obviously the, the threat of injury with, a, with a such a large um, weight differential is, is obviously there. Um, so do you have a specific sort of approach that you take to that or? Yeah, um, so, so the game I play, I think, translates well across to, to different weight categories um, because I'm not a particularly fast competitor. Yep. Even for my weight division, I move really quite slowly. So my whole game is trying to slow down my opponent as much as possible. Yep. Oh, we'll pause for a sec. Sorry, guys, we're back. We just had an interruption. <laughs> we're, we're back. We're good. Um, All right. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so for my weight division, I'm I'm really quite slow for my weight division. I think is what I was saying. So my whole goal is to slow people down as much as possible when I'm going against people that are smaller and faster than myself. Mm. Um, my game actually, I think, does quite well against heavier opponents that are trying to pressure in towards me. Like, because I, I find, like, from a lot of those positions, I do a good job of, like, you know... Getting under um, them. Exactly, like, like creating, like, effective frames, mm. like, dealing with, like, the weight distribution quite well. But I still need to adapt my game um, based on my... Like, based on your opponent. Like, for example, um, I really like playing from, like, the saddle position for my leg locks. But against heavier people, I actually find reaping hooks a much better way to go mm. because you shift their weight away from you. So, like, yep. I'll adjust the attacks I go for based on my opponent. Yep. Um, I'll try and attack different things based on their size, like... Um, like I actually find Kimura actually does quite well against heavier opponents. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, I find Kimura does quite well against like 
different, like like actually smaller and like bigger, like bigger opponents. It just yep. I I, sh- I change my attack based on what's yeah exactly yeah. how heavy they are. Like like from bottom position, I'll secure a Kimura, mm. and typically um, against a smaller opponent or a similar sized opponent, I can use it to sweep them. Yep. Um, while against a heavier opponent, I have to focus on more moving myself around around them. them. Yep. Yeah, exactly, and and trying to like. like yeah, just move in different ways based on my opponent. But like overall, my game doesn't have to change too much. Yep. Um. I yeah, like I probably have to focus more on the grip fight against smaller people, only yep. because I need to make sure I'm slowing them down a lot more, using a lot of two on ones, dragging them down to the to the floor so they gain like heavy feet. Mm. Um, different things. But like I, I feel like my game just adjusts well. Yep. Okay. And. Um, so okay, so then you saw you went down to Melbourne. Yeah, you probably so, stayed yeah. on M- Mickey's couch. Yeah, exactly. So, couch. so exactly yeah. that. So so went down to Melbourne, like stayed on Mikhail's couch, and I got to see like how they were training and what like professional training actually looked like. Um, so so I came away from that, and I really just thought like, wow, like if I want to train jujitsu seriously, like and take competition seriously, that's probably the place I need to be. So that was something I I, I was you know I I almost decided like while I was there that I need to move down to Melbourne and train here. Yeah. Um, but I probably didn't end up moving down there for about 12 months. I visited multiple times across that sort of period. Um, like, yeah, I, I probably visited multiple times across like that 12 months before actually moving down. Um, but in that time, I actually spoke to my my old coach, Luke, about that. And he was just straight away, like, he's, he's a big fan of Lachlan and Craig. And yeah. he, he was like, go, you got ex- to. Exactly. Yeah. Like, he was just straight away like, oh, yeah, absolutely. If you want to compete seriously, go, you, you need to move down there. Yeah. Like, like, that's absolutely the move to make. Like, Luke was really, really good about it, really understanding when I think in a lot of other situations, I've seen other coaches not be all that understanding yeah. about things like that. Absolutely. Um, Like, Luke is, yeah, Luke's just been like... um just an absolutely fantastic influence on, on me and my jujitsu. And like, has just like, I think Luke is someone that really has like his students best interests at heart. Yeah. Well, I think that open mindedness, open mindedness from him has translated to you. Like that makes you more open minded in your try approach. to be. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Try to be as much as possible. Yep. Like um, trying to yeah, just try and absorb like, you know, information from as many sources as mm. I can. Um, so yeah. on, on that point, right. So, um, Obviously, when you start training down at Absolute, there's, there's different coaches that take the different classes, right? And so you would have experienced, um, you know, Craig's teaching, Lachlan's teaching. You know, was there, were they very different in their styles and their approach or would you say that it was very much on the same vein? Um, I mean, they're different, but more from like a, I guess, like a stylistic sort of view. But like in a lot of ways, they also did like a lot of things the same. I'd say probably there's a bigger difference now with more like, you know, um, like with Craig training um, under John yes, a lot yep. more, but like yep. that's, I think that's inherent. Like I think Craig's adopted more of like John's style mm. and approach to jujitsu. Um, and, and, but really I think overall they're just like their stylistic differences. I think there's a lot of commonalities there. Yep. Yep. And obviously they're different sizes too, right? Like it, so exactly. that always like, plays into it. Yeah, exactly. And as well as like, um, even, not even just different sizes, but also different proportions. Yep. Like, like which leg I think length, changes it. Exactly. Length. Relative leg, leg length and arm length. Um, as well as like yeah, so exactly that. Like things change across different weight divisions as well. Like, like, uh, like one of the ideas. I mean, like maybe there's someone that that can comment and correct me on this. But my understanding is what you see a lot of the times is that um, at the heavier weight divisions you go, you see people playing less guard because generally like power to weight ratio changes. Mm. So like you know the ability for a small person to move another small person in the lower weight divisions from like you know bottom position is like typically their ability to do that is much greater mm. um, than as you get to like the heavier divisions. Like it's really hard from bottom position to move a really heavy opponent, even yep. if you are quite large yourself. Yep. My understanding of that is it's it's um, what they call it cross-sectional force. Okay. I think the idea is like when you have a like a, a limb that is twice as long, you don't need twice as much muscle to be proportionally as strong. You actually need a squared amount. Okay. So that idea is like as you get to like the heavier weight divisions, people are generally quite longer. Yeah. But you need to be like, you know, a squared amount, like like you know, have like proportionally greater muscle. To be able to move that same to be able to yep. move like in the same way. Mm. So so that's one of the other things that I think changes across different weight divisions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well I guess the you know, the the pressure itself is over a larger cross section too, right? Exactly. There's more weight, there's um, and but the the cross section's larger as well. Exactly. So so yeah. exactly that. Like yeah. and so that's my understanding as to why you'll also like why like you know simply like the heavy guy can't just play the exact same Baron Bolo game as like you know the sixty kilo guy. Yeah. It'd be like, very scary if they did. Exactly. <laughs> it, it's why like for example you'll see like uh 
uh, like in MMA, for example, yeah. like someone like Demetrius Johnson yeah. has like a very dynamic game yeah. and like he can pick up his opponent and hit a flying arm in midair. Yeah, but you won't right. see that in the heavyweight division. No. Yeah. Part that's of right. it could also be like, I think in the heavyweight division, guys have got a much higher like um, percentage of like body, pat, uh, body fat percentage. Yeah. Um, but outside of that, I think even when you see the really, really jacked guys, you're not going to see the same level of like dynamic movement at yeah. the heavyweight divisions, even if like, you know. That's right. There's a difference. Like the tempo is very different. Absolutely. Right? When you watch heavyweights in, in, in mixed martial arts, like it's a it's a much slower pace. And even the guys that might operate at a, at a higher pace, like, you know, that's their, their heart has yeah. to be pumping to, to get all that blood circulating through. I think, part, and, and like, I guess on that as well, it's part of the reason why you typically won't see like a heavy gymnast, mm. typically they're quite small because it's the ability for them to move their own weight. body. Exactly, yeah. power to weight, that, that cross-sectional force um, that goes into it. So I think those are like things that go, come into like uh, a differences in like like people's teaching is because of their their perspective for like how jiu-jitsu works. Because mm-hmm. for example, like I, I weigh as much as I weigh. Mm. Sure, my weight and size, like your weight and size can change a little bit across yep. the course of like your, your jiu-jitsu career, mm. but it's not going to change dramatically enough for me to fully understand what it's like to be a 100 kilo person. Yeah. Like, like, like it's not just without a lot of um, bummer. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> <That's exactly. how> <laughs> but, but even then, like I, I I'll, my limb length will stay the same, <laughs> like things like that, or, or even like the opposite, like, for me to get down to 50 kilos, like it's very, very tough. Yeah. So just talking about um, weight, right? So uh, do you do much strength and conditioning work? Um, I don't. I'm I'm talking to JT at the moment. I'm getting back into like bulletproof for BJJ. I used to do a little bit of it. Mm. Um, but the focus there is less on like actually getting, I guess, like traditionally stronger Strong, and yeah. more, more focusing on joint sports mobility. Specific. Yeah, yeah, yeah sports specific, uh, like more joint mobility and things like that. Yeah. Okay. Like, like and, and also joint stability. Yep. Yeah, no, absolutely. Okay, and so then, um, you know, in the lead up that twelve months before you've um, made the, the the final move to to go down there, um, was there things that you had to prepare in in your own personal life, or was it just like, okay, no, nah, I'm, you know, over that twelve months, it was like, no, no, I'm going to make this decision. Yeah, it was like I didn't really. It was more just a matter of like pulling the trigger. Yeah, because like um, because of my like because of work at the time as well. Like I was in like quite a important position at work and it was going to be difficult to replace me. But then it's one of those things where you think like, like I guess what they tell you is like, you know, they can put an ad in the paper the next day, like to replace you. Mm. But like, it was also like, just like a risky move where it's like, do I really want to do this? Like, yeah. like is this a good idea? Like, is this just going to be a total flop? And like, I go nowhere and mm. like, I just waste several years of my life, like going like, you know, chasing after this. Yeah. It's turned out okay, unfortunately, yeah. but uh, but well, like it could also I, go. Yeah, uh, sometimes I think it's when you have no choice, right? By when you've made that decision and you've committed and you don't have any choice, there's no choice but success. Yeah, right. Because yeah, yeah, you could have failed and you wouldn't might have had to come home or whatever. But yep. with your back against the wall, that's typically when people are most dangerous, right? And we see that in 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 fighting in in sports as well. Yeah. You know, when when somebody's got their back against the cage, like a Tyron Woodley in the past, you know, he would be knocking people out with his right hand with his back against the cage. Yeah, exactly. Right? Now, obviously, people have worked out that strategy and they work out how to how to get around that. Um, and he's you know maybe has also become more trigger shy or you know less um, uh, explosive over the over, over the years or something, but. Um, you know, typically when you don't have a choice, I think that's when you actually get, get a lot of success. And, and the, the way that I could put it, like even in my own life and why I've been successful in, in, in terms of my working career is because, you know, um, when, when I was going through uni and I had to find a job because my mum, I'd sent my mum overseas because, she, you, know, you know, she was dealing with some health things and, you know, I wanted her to try and have a bit of a reset. And, you know, I didn't have a great relationship with my dad at that point in time. So I was basically, you know, working as an apprentice mechanic Yep. making six bucks an hour trying to make ends meet um doing that you know um training kung fu you know five times a week um going to uni yep. uh doing one day of tafe you know doing all this you know and it was probably the most difficult like four odd years of my life but you had to make it work but you had to yeah you, you don't you, i never thought about it and gone oh my life's fucked like i've just looked at it and gone oh let's just you know keep going you got to make do with what you've got you, yeah you just make do and you don't even think about it. I, don't, I actually don't think i had any time to question it <laughs> or to feel like, hey, you know, is this actually even worth it? Yeah. You know, and I think actually, you know, um, now nowadays because I've got a little bit more time, um, you know, may- maybe I'm, I'm uh, I sometimes feel more disf- dissatisfied with life because I can think <laughs> about it more, right? Like if I just keep busy, and then I don't have time to think about it. You can't feel dissatisfied about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, you know, when you so you've moved down to to Melbourne, did you have you did you line up your job 
in Melbourne? Because obviously you still need to work at that point. Absolutely, in time, yeah. Right? So, so I, um, my uh, my uncle and auntie uh, lived down in Melbourne, and so they they actually hired me for work, which was really really fortunate. Like it meant that like when I moved down there, I had a job straight away. Um, so it was good to be able to like organize that ahead of time. Like I'm very fortunate in that regard because it meant that I had like a stable income. Actually, probably one of the more stressed times of my life was when I, I actually left that job and went full time, like like properly full time with jujitsu in terms of like not just like, you know, I was trading, you know, multiple times a day and yep. still working. But like I went, I'm only doing jujitsu and I'm trying to make my living off that is actually probably one of the more stressed times in my life was like yep. trying to be able to afford rent and things like that. <laughs> so so having the job like was very, very fortunate that I was able to do that because it allowed me to get really, really settled. Get in, exactly. And let me get into a really comfortable position. Yeah. So it made that transition even easier. So rather than simply it being like an all or nothing, like I okay, moved down to Melbourne and I'm just going to go, you know, um, the full favela style from the get go. Yeah. Um, it allowed me to make it like a reasonably comfortable transition, transition. Yep. into that. Yep. And so then from that perspective, like obviously that meant that you would have started teaching more and taking on more responsibilities. At Absolutely. The so, so, exactly. Me. Yeah. So, so that's where, so, so to make the decision to go from, you know, working the job that I had um, into like, you know, uh, going like properly full time with jujitsu was just as like over time, like opportunities to teach more privates, like people were more interested in like learning from me. Um, a chance to teach more seminars and things like that, as well as um, having a job made it very difficult for me to actually go away for competition. Mm. So like, it was like, you know, always like hell every single time I need to do that. Trying to yeah, plan yeah. around it. Exactly. Just cause like, you know, if they're short staffed, like there's big things going on, like, yep. like at work, like just variety of reasons as to why. So that helped, contributed towards like, you know, making it easier decision for me to go full time with jujitsu. But it also meant that when I went full time with jujitsu, I also had more time to like, chase those opportunities to teach and compete mm. and, and make ends meet. Yep. And then, so from that perspective, right, like I, I think there's, there's definitely going to be a hustle element there, right? Like when you've gone into that and you've, you no longer have the, the security of a, of a job, um, what were, what were some of the things that you started to think about in terms of, you know, how, how do you, how do you make this work? How do you need to hustle to, to try and generate enough income to survive and continue doing what you're yeah, doing? So, so most of the money to be like, like in jujitsu comes from teaching mm. and, I, I think like I'm f I'm fortunate in that regard because I actually like the teaching more than I like the competing. Yep. I uh, like I, I'm I'm very much into the jujitsu technique and like like that's where my priorities lie. Yep. And to me I find competition is a way to express that and test that. Mm. So I think in jujitsu like this just like long term, like uh, there's more opportunities as an instructor. Yep. Than there is at a competitor. Um I think I think actually Craig might have said that or maybe Lachlan, I can't remember. One of them said it to me one time where you'll spend more, like most of your career is going to be spent as an instructor, not as a competitor. Yeah. Like at some stage, like there's going to be a day where you'll stop competing you and, and you're just going to be, you're going to be coaching and you're going to be training again. Yeah. Like, like, so really like if you're gearing your skill sets towards that long term, you'll be better off. Mm -hmm. But like, fortunately that's what I really enjoy doing. Yep. I, I know some people that are like, they teach, but they don't want to, and they're simply just doing it to make ends meet so they can keep yeah. competing. Yeah. While like really, I'm competing so I can teach. Teach. Yeah. And I think I think the students also cotton onto that as well. Yep. You know, like because if if you've got somebody who is you know uh, un unreservingly giving you everything that they've got, yep. um, that is is going to promote more not just loyalty. Loyalty is probably not the right word, but they're, they're, that's also going to. Um, just builds up at harbors like yeah. a positive relationship yeah. and like a like a trusting relationship with students. Like I've even got one student that actually moved here to Sydney with me to keep training. Like yeah, well, wow. like and so yeah, like like I I want to make sure that I'm actually putting the time in mm. um, to my students, like to make sure that like it's going to be worth it for them to be training with me. Like I I really want to make sure I I um sort of like uh, set myself up to be like a really good coach in jiu jitsu and like mm. because I I think I've had such positive in like like uh, positive coaches in my career, I'd like to be a really positive, positive influence, influence to some, exactly to yep. someone else like coming up in jujitsu and like make sure that not only do they have the ability to have the same opportunities that I had in jujitsu, but actually to have greater opportunities mm. if I can. Yeah. Um, one of the standards Lachlan sets for, for like anytime he gives someone a black belt is that, you know, he wants them to at least be better than what he was when he got his black belt. And I, th I'd like to like carry that on as well. Mm. Like, 
I said this to one of my students the other day is my goal as a coach is to get that person's like a, like say if we're working on half guard passing, mm. I want them to get to my level of half guard passing in a shorter amount, a significantly shorter amount of time than what it took for me to get to that level. Yeah. And so um, in term, like talking about teaching, right? So I think um, as with anything in life, so uh, the way that I would explain this in, in terms of the working in, in terms of work, right? Is that, um, when I look at, uh, and I'll use the work example because then we can translate it to the teacher example. Um, if, if you look at any sort of business, um, there's typically three layers, right? So you've got like the owners and the, the leaders of that company. Um, you'd have the managers, um, so the middle level management, and you'd have the employees who do the, who do the work in terms of the tasks. Um, and then depending on the size of the organization, right? In some, if it's a one man, you know, self-managed business, then that one person is all three roles. But then the bigger the company, then obviously the more uh, delineation you have between those three things, right? And typically, you know, what makes an employee successful um, uh, is, is uh, I guess, what, what earns them more remuneration is a combination of, of, of three factors, um, you know, generally it's their, you know, if it's, if we're talking about cars, right, it'll be knowledge of the, the product. Um, the second thing would be the knowledge of um, the systems that we use and the actual processes that we have in the business. And then the third thing is then their ability to actually complete those tasks. Um, because, you know, they're, they're coin operated, they're commission based, the, the better they do the tasks, the more, the more money they make. And um, typically what you find with any high, high performing employee that gets to the upper end of the pay scale, in terms of the dollars because, you know, their knowledge is good, their knowledge of the systems and process is good, and then their ability to complete is really good, is that then they typically, you know, want to go and become a manager, right? And so that's almost like, you know, uh, moving from a jiu-jitsu student into a jiu-jitsu coach. Um, you know, the thing, but the things that make you successful as a manager is very different to the things that makes you successful as the, as the employee or the student. I think that's actually one of the things you see get talked about a lot more now is like, like these theories on like, you know, middle management, why it's so inefficient. Yeah. Like, because like, you know, people that get promoted to middle, middle management might not necessarily now be actually one of the best workers because yep. you don't actually want to take someone that's one of the best workers out of the position that they're clearly like thriving Driving. in. Yep. You want to put someone that isn't the best worker in the middle management position. Yeah. And then like you end up with people, I guess, aren't particularly good at uh yeah that that, yeah. that happens in a lot of companies right yeah. and so you know so I, I i always one of the things that i've been doing with all my staff members is going through that exact thing and then the next thing that i i then look at you know from a investment perspective so me as a as a, as a leader when i choose who i'm going to invest my time into to develop from a from a working situation it's the people that are obviously loyal to you know um the direction that we want to take the company you know there's no point um if they're not loyal to the direction that we want to we want to go um, the second thing we look at is how well do they work with um, their, their colleagues and their teammates, you know, so from a harmony perspective, what does that look like? And then, you know, what kind of result do they generate for me? Because if they don't generate a result, they're never going to have the respect of their peers, right? But the thing that I've been really big on in terms of from, from you know, um, I guess, you know, if you think about it from the business perspective is that a lot of the times, you know, those good employees or those good students may not become the best managers or teachers because there is no handbook that you get given when you suddenly become a teacher or a manager, yep. right? Um, so what, what I, I guess where I'm going with this is that I, I'm sort of curious, you know, um, what sort, you know, and I know you, you, you've obviously you enjoyed the teaching aspect, but, you know, what sort of influences have you sort of um, brought into your own learning to become a better teacher and, and uh, developed yourself as a, as a management slash teacher category? Yeah, so I've been very fortunate across my jiu-jitsu career to have like a number of uh, – influential and like really quite good coaches like uh, i mentioned before um like luke beston for example another black belt i, I train under um a coach of mine grant bradshaw as well mm -hmm. um so grant's uh, a high school teacher um and he brings like a lot of charisma across as well mm -hmm. as well as being like a very like um i guess like yeah like like effective like teacher as well because like you know he's got his experience as a high school teacher he knows how to like you know communicate with people effectively but as well as like he's also similar to luke very open-minded um and, and very like uh i guess generous overall as a coach like he's very much like wants to like put effort into like investing in his students and so like i've had like like very positive influences there and then as well as like um you know with lachlan as well like again like a renowned coach at jiu-jitsu as well as like a high level competitor like he's been a fantastic influence on me mm. as well as uh craig's a really really good coach as well i think um I think people can like know this from like if they like have seen Craig's instructionals, for example, mm. um, that like he's a, he's a very good coach, but he's also like, well, sorry, he's a very good instructor, but he's also a very good coach. Like he has a lot of wisdom, I think, um, from his career that like he, he translates across to me and like both him and Lachlan have really helped give me opportunities in jiu-jitsu that have uh, 
really helped my career. Mm. Um, like, yeah, and like, like just really good, I guess, uh, combination of both like career and life advice. Yeah, like that comes from both of them, which has been like really influential. And so from that, I try and I try and look more broadly as well as like different effective coaches in jujitsu. So like looking at people like John Danaher, looking at like someone like Eddie Cummings, for example, like. Mm. I'd say Eddie Cummings actually probably he's he's more of like an actually like a technical instructor. He's someone like to look at. While like I guess someone someone like John Danaher is both a technical instructor as well as a coach. Mm. Like in terms of like you know things that are outside I guess the technical side of it. Yep. Um, and like just yeah, trying to look across the board at like just what makes different coaches effective. Like even looking at like Unity for example, you have someone like Murillo, Murillo Santana like like um that's brought together like a really effective team for unity mm. um, and like, you know, brought guys across from both like the Cicero Costa team and also like Barbosa. Yeah. Um, like looking at what he's doing, uh, looking at even guys like Andre Garval, for example, mm. like, like even though like, he's not like a John Danaher, he's still put together a very successful team yeah. and like trying yeah. to understand like, okay, like what has he done there? And so like, you know, what sort of environment has he created? Same with like looking at the Mendez brothers, like the transition they've made from, you know, the highest level competitors in the sport mm. to a very successful jiu-jitsu team and looking at what they're doing there. Yeah. Um, so I, I try and look more broadly, even though I have probably what's probably more obviously my core influences on my jiu-jitsu. I, I try yep. and be a bit more broad. I even try and look at other sports if I can. Like I try and look at like across to like MMA. Um, I try and look across at like, you know, like uh, coaching in judo, uh, yep. coaching in wrestling, like yep. to understand a little bit better yep. of what's going on. Even trying to... Um, look outside of that because I guess like one of the things you'll see with someone like, like John Danaher is like, you know, people understand like his background and philosophy. And so one of the things I like to do in jujitsu is when I'm looking at like any sort of source of like knowledge in jujitsu, I also try and look at what their background is, try and get a better understanding of like where they came from to end up where they are. Yeah. So like, for example, um, you know, everyone looks at, say, like, Paul Harris for his leg locks, but mm. I try to look into finding out where did his leg locks come from, for example. Yeah. And similarly with, like, John Danaher looking at, like, what his influences were on his uh, his coaching. So, like, looking at, like, you know, his background in epistemology, mm. like, you know, the, um, like, the philosophy, like, basically, like, you know, like, like, people say, like, you know, he's got a philosophy background, but, like, they don't know that necessarily that his background is epistemology, which, to my understanding, is... Um, it's basically the the process of uh, dividing up information into like hierarchies and like mm. structures, so that way you can teach it and transfer it across to someone else. Yeah, yeah. I think everybody always focuses on, oh, yeah, you know, he's a proponent of the Socratic method, hence why they, you know, they're always asking questions. But that's only a very you know surface level approach to it. Right? Absolutely. So, yeah. so just tr so one of the things I try and do is I try and look broadly as much as I can, but also trying to like from each like like from individual sources, trying to look at like where they come from, like mm. what their background is, what influenced them to become the people that they are. Yep. Yep. Well, that's, you know, hence part of the reason why I do this podcast, right? Like it's, I think it's really interesting to see, you know, how people get on this pathway. Yep. Um, and then, you know, when you look at all these different influences, like I think, you know, one of the resounding things that I think um, in all my conversations is that, you know, um, nobody is, has ever done it on their own. Like there's always great influences within their lives that have helped them to get to these specific pathways. Absolutely. Um, you know, just talking on that, you know, when it came to, so, you know, obviously when, when COVID's happened and then you've made the decision to come back to Sydney, um, what was then your, how, how did you then set up, you know, um, the, the, the places where you're currently teaching at and all that sort of stuff? How did you find all that? Um, it's just all through like people I've like known across my jiu-jitsu career. Like, um, like for example, like one of the places I teach now is grappling education. So I teach at a couple of different places in Sydney, but one of them is grappling education. So, so grappling education is headed by uh, Keller Loxodi. Keller uh, went to ADCC in 2019. He's one of the Australians that qualified. So mm -hmm. Keller's a very high-level competitor in jiu-jitsu, but he also comes from a very high-level judo background. And so I know Keller through uh, my teammate, Mikhail Yahaya. So it's mm -hmm. interesting sort of um, where you look at, like, these relationships come from because I, I know Mikhail from, like, a random match I had in Sydney yep. where we had a chat afterwards and he goes, come down and visit. Yep. I went down and visited and through Mikhail I ended up meeting Keller. Yep. And, like, I think I'd only actually met Keller or spoken to Keller twice before he actually asked, like, like invited me to like come teach a class at Grappling Education. Um, I think, I, I think I'd, I'd met him once at a competition here in Sydney, um, and then I think I just popped in to visit one time to train, like when I was yep. here in Sydney, like after coming up after the first lockdown, 
And then from there, like he, he asked if I just wanted to teach like a class on Friday and it's grown from there. So now I'm teaching four classes a week there. Yep. Um, another place I'm teaching at is like uh, Sydney uh, Jiu-Jitsu Academy in Maroubra. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know Johnny from there uh, through um, one of my uh, friends, Marcio Ikamatsu. So so Marcio introduced me to Johnny because Johnny wanted to come down to Absolute in, in Melbourne and like train with Lachlan. Yep. And I think he hit it off with Marcio and Marcio said like, oh yeah, you know, you should get in contact with Johnny. And because of that, I ended up, uh, Johnny ended up flying Lachlan and I up for Lachlan to teach a seminar. And so I just like assisted with like, like yep. coaching the seminar while we we're up in Sydney. And then from there, it means like, you know, now that I'm in Sydney now, like Johnny's like got me coaching once a week there. Yep. Okay. Um. So like, yeah, I think like a lot of these, these sort of relationships build up like through just small connections over time. Yep. And I think that's why it's, it's funny. You see people burn certain bridges in their career because mm. like, 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 I guess you never know, like like how these things go and how it affects other relationships you have with people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, 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 at the end of the day, there's always, um, you know, I think at some point you can, yeah, you've got that. You, it's a choice that you make, right? You can either choose to just be, okay, if, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. You know, I, I have this, um, I, sometimes I feel this way about, you know, having to let people go at work, yep. right? Um, that, you know, you, you'd love to, you know, you might in, you really enjoy them as people, but you know, from a business perspective, it may not be right for them. And, in, in by me keeping those people and not making those hard decisions, sometimes it's actually I'm doing them a disservice because their true calling they might they, they might be like in this comfort relationship that they've got a job, yep. right? And then but it may not they might not be very good at it or they may not be motivated to do that job, you know. But so by me not actually if they're not the big enough person to actually turn around and say to me, Johnny, look, I I don't want to do this anymore, yep. and I have to turn around and say, look, it's not going to work out, you know, I don't want you to do this anymore. Yep. Um, you know, I, I, the way that I sort of approach it now is that, hey, if I don't say that, I'm doing them a disservice because their true calling or their true passion or their next greatest opportunity could be right around the corner. And by me holding on to this person who's not even doing a very good job for me, then I'm, I'm actually preventing them from maybe finding their success. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, exactly. And, and on top of that as well, it's like if they're not doing a good job, like they like people need to be like shown that essentially like, you know, because like the, otherwise they, they, you know, if let's say for example, like it could even – even outside of like what you're saying there it's like if they're just like you know working along and they think they're doing a fantastic job but they're like barely like you know yeah, scraping the by yeah exactly yeah. like they're, they're, they're barely meeting the minimum standard like they're not even aware of that like it could be a good wake-up call to them like you know hey this is a competitive environment like you need to be doing more yep it's the same actually you see that in jujitsu where like you know i i i try and stay out of like I guess the beef, <laughs> yeah, the the beef in jujitsu. But I guess like this is one of them. Like, like I'm really i I really don't understand the benefit, at least to the individual, for not cross training. Yeah, uh, in jujitsu, like, like you know, it, it it exposes you to a similar idea to that where you know, like you could think like you know you're one of the best guys that you know at jujitsu. Yep. But like that might be just within your gym. Like if you cross train, you'll expose yourself to the fact that like there's so much more going on out there. Actually, I can guarantee if you're like only training at one gym and you think you're the mm. best guy at jujitsu, yeah. Like if you but you've never trained anywhere else, it's a big fish in a small pond. Exactly, you're probably actually not all that good at jujitsu, especially yeah. if you've only trained at one place. Like, yeah. I, like I think it's really important to be able to like expose yourself to new things. Like, yeah. I you know I actually I'll, I'll bring up a, a you know um, thing that I think is yeah on that on that vein right. So I think that's actually why um, jiu-jitsu has flourished so much um, in recent years is because it's, one, it's, it's, it's almost like you're speaking a, a specific language that you could go anywhere in the world if there's a jiu-jitsu school and, you, you know, um, and, and you're polite, you turn up, you, know, you, know, you ask the instructor of that school, can I come and do a lesson or whatever, and you know, it's, it's very welcoming and open typically, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, um, like I you know, have done, I did kung fu for 20-something odd years of my life, and it was it was the opposite, you know. And when I say the, when I say the opposite, um, you know, because you're speaking such a specific language in whatever particular style of kung fu that you're doing, it's almost frowned upon. When you go to visit another school, it's more like you're going there to challenge them, as opposed to actually trying to trying to learn and and, and broaden your horizons, right? And I guess the stark contrast would be um, when you think of um, you know Shaolin kung fu or whatever. How Shaolin kung fu came about, historically speaking, was that. Um, they actually brought all the you know instructors and masters back to the temple to then share the knowledge, right? So these guys have gone out from you know the Shaolin Temple and gone and visited other places and picked up different ideas, and then they've actually all brought it back. And so then it's like you know from that point there, you know there there would have been a great evolution in the in the level of the art because obviously you're exchanging ideas, you're developing from other sources. But then 
you know, from that point, then it's become something secretive where every subsequent generation, as opposed to getting better, you're actually getting less because, you know, if the idea is that, you know, um, if I learn from you and I'm only going to ever be 80% of your, your, your caliber, and then, you know, and then I then teach students and they're only going to be 80% of my caliber. Well, over time, 0.8 times 0.8, you know, you're now at 0.6, uh, 0, 0.064 or whatever, yeah. you know. Um, so the caliber is actually um, reducing over time. Absolutely. Like it's, and that's like reasons for as an individual cross training and like, you know, visiting other gyms to train. Like I, I think uh, this notion of loyalty and like, I guess, creonchism in jujitsu is like the greatest business idea of all time. Yeah. Like it's really just like a way of like, you know, making sure that you don't see what else is out there and like yep. you only pay money to like your gym. Yeah. Like, I mean, like we won't name names on like, like any particular no, gym that does not. this, yeah. but like there's like major, I guess, like franchises, franchises. in yeah, jiu-jitsu yeah. where like, you know, this is the case and like they, it's like pushed out there under the guise of loyalty, but really it's like loyalty to who? Like if you're a paying customer, yeah. like I, I, I don't need to be paying money to someone for them to treat me like a child. Mm. Like if it's any other business, like, in the world, yep. if like I don't like a product, like you can't tell yeah, me you where can I take your money, money elsewhere. I can That's go, right. yeah, exactly. Like if I want to buy like you know two different types of printers, like I can do that. It's not like I buy one printer and then it's like you know, yep. like they say you can never buy another printer again. Otherwise, you're never allowed to use yeah. that product. It's, it's right. such a ridiculous notion. Yeah. Like you even see, I, I don't even understand it actually. I, I've seen it recently with 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 some gyms, for example, where someone will be paying at one gym and then they'll like pay some money to also trained another gym yep. they're not switching gyms yep. they're paying, they're paying at two gyms. they're paying yep. at two gyms and then the first gym kicks them out because they were paying at another gym it's like like yeah. that's a ridiculous, ridiculous idea, idea. the me. guys like, paying for both gyms yeah like like I, i've seen that happen as well which boggles my mind even further because i know that this idea of like loyalty like is essentially a business tactic but then i see things like that and then that really confuses me because that doesn't make sense on multiple levels mm. Say, I think it, this what all that all this boils down to, um, and it's a it's a common saying in the in the business world that people don't leave companies, people leave people. Yeah. Right. So it's not it's not the the, the company like even the company doesn't have any, you know, particular position. It's the it's the position of the people that are in that company that d- devise that. Hey, this is these are the rules, right? And so you know, um, when 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 you as an employee, you know, or a student decide that you want to leave a particular place. It could be well because hey, you know, the the it's not the company that's at fault. It's the it could be the manager, yeah, right, or the or the instructor. Because at the end of the day, the the, the actual brand itself doesn't have, hold any specific value. It only holds the value that we as the students and the people breathe into it. I right? agree. And so it's the same thing, you know, with jujitsu. It's um, it's jujitsu would be nothing without anybody training jujitsu. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so, I completely agree. Yeah. Like I like for me like I align myself with like you know like. Uh, like, you know, Absolute, for example, because of Lachlan and Craig. Yep. Like, like because of the influence they had. Like, if they if they had no association with it, then, like, it doesn't mean much for me to associate with it for exactly that reason. It's, like, associating yep. with people. Yeah. Um, like, because exactly that, like, people are, like, it's just, I, I th- yeah, I think it's weird. I, I think brand loyalty is such a weird thing in the modern yep. day. Yep. Um, like, I, I understand it to a degree where it's, like, you like particular brands. Mm. Um. But there's a weird, uh, like, materialism culture that, that's, <laughs> like, occurred in the modern day. Like, it's almost like what they talk about with Fight Club. Like, yeah. it's, yeah, just, I, I, it's weird to see, like, how these things sort of cross over in jiu-jitsu. Like, it's, it's interesting, actually, how commercial jiu-jitsu is, mm. which makes it quite different to a lot of other martial arts. Yeah. Like, it's one of the things, like, when you, like, for, for any athlete that's coming up in jiu-jitsu, like, like, when you're talking about, like, getting sponsors and things like that, one of the big things to put across um, if you were trying to get a sponsorship is, like, is, like, putting across the fact that, like, you know, let's say they're a non-jiu-jitsu sponsor and you want them to sponsor you as a jiu-jitsu athlete. Like, mm. one of the big things to put across them is the fact that jiu-jitsu is not like other martial arts where, like, you know, say, for example, judo, you can't have sponsorships. Like, yep. like you know, if you're competing in, like, you know, karate, for example, it's like, you know, like, that's not a particularly commercial product. Mm. Like, typically people that are doing, like, you know, wrestling, like, it's... um you know, it's it's performed by by high school students yep. or like like college students for the mm. most part. Jiu Jitsu is typically performed by like you know adults with paying jobs, yep. and it's quite a like a commercial product. Like it's almost akin to a uh, to like cy- like like cycling or yep. golf. Yep. Where like it's more about like the gear you're wearing, like the products you're associated yep. with, and things like that, which is really quite a weird one to see come across in Jiu Jitsu. Yeah, I I I 
I definitely think that that's um, a very strange thing, but I think it just go- goes to, you know, um, the caliber of individuals that typically train jujitsu are generally quite rational in their approach. Yep. You know, and as a result of that, you know, I think um, that 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 sort of um, uh, advertising that comes from, you know, you if you're hearing it from somebody that you appreciate in the sport, yep. you know, and that's obviously you know part of the reason why you know Joe Rogan has such a huge influence, right? Yep. It's because most guys that are that like MMA and that sort of thing would listen to Joe Rogan, right? Yeah. So the things that he promotes is obviously a huge brand that's that's built around that. Yeah. Yeah. I like with Joe actually because I uh, he certainly has like sponsors for his show, but then he also will go on there and like he'll actually like just have products that he actually likes. Enjoys. And like I, I think that's yeah. fine. Like I think like that that's a good is, balance. Yeah, that, that that's fine. But th- there's like a weird cultishness that comes across with a lot of this uh Yeah. Yeah, like there's a weird level of a culture that comes across with like the modern day. And I think that's actually, it's probably not even like just a, a result of, or like that doesn't necessarily just like come from like with commercial products. I think there was a good like New York Times article where it's like in the modern day now, like people are just finding certain things to completely re- revolve their lives around. Now, this is a funny thing for someone that made their hobby their career. <laughs> like I'm definitely an example of that, but yep. it, it's, it's kind of funny. Like, like, um, You'll even see it, like, say, for example, in coffee. Yep. Like, like for me, like, like I do jiu-jitsu as my career now. Mm. Um, and so one of my hobbies is coffee. And people might, like, for people that aren't into coffee, they might, like, wonder, like, you know, how is that actually a hobby? But, like, like it's something that you can get really quite deep into. And, like, yeah. the same thing with, like, things like tea. Like, I think, like, anything you can get quite deep into. Yeah. But one of the things you'll see happen in, like, like coffee is, like, a hobby is that everyone, like, after that eventually gets to a certain stage where they're, like, well, now I need to open a cafe. Yeah. Like all that, I need to become like a barista or something like that. Like, like it's interesting to see like sort of the way the world's gone. And it's also at the same, at the same time, I think really, really cool because now you can actually like, because of like so many opportunities in the modern day, you can actually just take something you love and like make a living out of it. That's right. So, so I guess there's like interesting pros and cons to a lot of this stuff. Yeah. Well, I also think that, you know, we're in a, we're in a, a day and age where, now, because information is so readily available, you can actually pursue more than one thing. Absolutely. You know, like when I was, when, so when I was, you know, um, starting my career in the automotive industry, like I had a boss who's, who was really, he's really good at, he was really good at golf. And he was saying how he had to make that choice and he sacrificed his golf career um, to become a car dealer. And, and yeah, look, you know, I, I can appreciate that. Um, and, but, you know, like that, I, I feel like that, you know, and I, I appreciate him for many reasons because he was a, a great mentor to me. But I think sometimes some of those things, you just like we say, you know, you have to reevaluate, you know, um, what you think about certain positions and concepts in jiu-jitsu. Uh, I, I needed to reevaluate on, on that, on my position on that because um, that actually stuck with me for, for a long time. So, you know, but it didn't actually make me happy to feel like I was sacrificing, you know, martial arts and my passion for martial arts for my career. Like if anything, it probably, I find more fulfillment being able to p- pursue both, both things equally. Yeah. Like, right? yeah, absolutely. Like I, I think like it's, it's good to have the freedom like that in the modern day, like before we were talking about um, how like I was considering like going back to university. Like the reason I'm doing that is not actually because I want to shift careers. It's actually just again, like to just diversify what I'm doing in my yep. life. Like just to have something more to do, yep. like just something that's interesting. Like it, essentially just like, it's another hobby. Yep. Well that, that, you know, it goes back to one of my all time favorite sayings of how you do anything is how you do everything. Yeah. You know, that's the very Mia Masato, Mia, Mia Mato, Mia, no, Musashi. Mia, Musashi concept. You yep. know, when you see the way in one thing, you can see the way in all things. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. And you can have that translated learning. So I think on that note, that's a good way to, to end things. Awesome. Um, you know, tell people how to find you. Awesome. So uh, you can reach me on Facebook or Instagram. Instagram's probably the best way to reach me. I'm just uh, at Jeremy Paul Skinner yep. um, on Instagram. So that's probably the best way to get to me. I try and reply to as many people as I can. <laughs> like, uh, like not that I'm like getting like bombarded with messages. It's more the fact that I'm really terrible at replying <laughs> sometimes. Like I will get back to people, yeah. but it might take me like, like, you know, four to five business days. Yeah. And, and so I, I know this from experience because sometimes Jeremy's like, Oh, Johnny, I, I thought I, I thought I responded to you, but I must've forgotten. <laughs> yeah, like, like sometimes it'll be like, I'll see the message in my notifications. I think out my reply in my head yeah. and then I don't actually open the message or reply. <laughs> and then, <laughs> like a week later i'm like oh i didn't send that message all right i'll send it now and i'll send an apology too but like I, i'm getting to a point now where i don't even put the apology <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then from a um obviously you've got a whole bunch of things coming out on technically yeah yep. exactly so i've got an instructional on technically looking at fundamental heel hook escape so it's uh um the the first instructional i've ever put out um where we look at basically trying to um 
not just escape heel hooks, but also looking at trying to take apart like leg positions our opponents put us in and try and go on the offensive immediately. So we're looking at uh, escaping the inside heel hook from both saddle and 50-50 and the outside heel hook and like looking to defend that and how to transform different position leg positions our opponent will put us into into a, an offensive position for us. Yep. Okay. And you're going to you obviously that's going to be something that you're going to try and do more of in the future. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm also putting uh, videos out on YouTube now. Uh, it's just on YouTube Jeremy Skinner. Uh, I think it might even be Jeremy Skinner BJJ. So so trying to put out technique videos on there every single week. Yep. Um looking at a broad range of topics both like fundamental jiu-jitsu as well as more specific uh like competition based jiu-jitsu. So recently we just put out a video on finishing the armbar and we also looked at my favorite grip break from the uh from like the classic armbar position yep. which I, I think if you check that video out it's actually probably a grip break you probably haven't seen before. So okay. uh, yeah, to check, check out my YouTube guys. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.